Good afternoon. This time is 5.45 p.m. on Wednesday, October 24th, 2018, and this public meeting of the District of Columbia State Board of Education is now called to order. The roll will now be called to determine the presence of a quorum. Mr. Haywood, would you please call the roll? Ms. Williams. Here. Mr. Jacobson. Present. Ms. McClay. Ms. McClay. Ms. Wilson-Phelan. Ms. Wilson-Phelan. Ms. Wattenberg. Uh, present. Mr. Jones. Present. Mr. Whedon. Mr. Whedon. Mr. Batchelor. Present. Ms. Alcia. Ms. Alcia. Ms. Robinson. Present. Madam President, you have quorum. A quorum has been determined, and the State Board will now proceed with the business portion of our meeting. Members, we have a draft agenda before us. Are there any corrections or additions? Seeing no changing, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. The motion has been properly moved and seconded. I will ask for uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion has been approved. Members, we have the, mem the minutes of the October 3rd working session before us. Are there any corrections or addition to these minutes? Seeing no changes, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. The motion being properly moved and seconded, I ask all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion has been approved. Good evening. My name is Karen Williams, Ward 7 representative and president of the State Board of Education. On behalf of the members of the District of Columbia State Board of Education, I want to welcome our guests and our excuse me, our guests. and viewing public to our Wednesday, October 24th public meeting. The State Board typically holds its regularly scheduled meetings on the third Wednesday of every month at the old council chambers at 441 4th Street Northwest. But due to early voting, we are, we, we are in room 412 of the John A. Wilson building tonight. In addition to broadcasting this meeting live by way of the District Knowledge Network, we are also live streaming by way of Periscope on Twitter and the video for the hearing will be posted on our YouTube page once the meeting concludes. Tonight's agenda includes two votes on two items honoring outstanding service to the District of Columbia educational system. The first is our formal ombudsman of public education, Joanna Smith, and the second is to honor Theodore C. Hinton, Jr., an educator in the District of Columbia Public Schools for over 50 years. We will also hear testimony today from panels discussing teacher retention. Earlier this year, the State Board commissioned a report giving for the first time solid data on the numbers of teachers leaving the classroom at the school level. Based on this report, the State Board made three recommendations. First, that the district established a single comprehensive and publicly available source of teacher and principal retention data. Second, that a better understanding of teacher and principal characteristics is needed. The State Board said at the release of the report and still believes that, what, that we need to know why teachers and principals are voluntarily leaving our system and what policies we can put in place to retain our highly qualified teachers. Finally, the State Board recommended that it continue to pursue additional research on teacher and principal retention. We must continue gathering data on this and other issues that affect the classroom experience for our students. Tonight, we will hear directly from students, teachers, and national and local experts as our next step in this process. The State Superintendent is unable to join us tonight so we will move directly to the comments from the public. The State Board welcomes public participation in activities under our authority. Any 
At every public meeting, we begin with testimony from public witnesses on education-related matters. Your comments will become part of our official record. If you are a member of the public and would like to speak at a future meeting, please contact our staff by email at sboe at dc.gov or by calling 202-741-0888. Tonight, <clears throat> we have 13 public witnesses. We have grouped the witnesses into three panels. As I call your name, please come down to the aisle. Candace Barbara, Mary Nizik, Marilyn Holmes, Dana Richard, Marilyn, is there anyone here? Okay. So, yeah. Josh, Josh Boots, Emily Griswold, Philip Copeland, Jill Telford. Fraser O'Leary, Fraser O'Leary, okay, you have three minutes to speak this evening, please note that you must use your microphone, to turn on your microphone press the button on the base, you will also see a timer at the center of the table. The light will be green for the first two minutes, two and a half minutes, and will turn yellow for the last 30 seconds, and will turn red after three minutes have left. Actually, tonight, because I know Ms. Holmes is here about Total Sunshine, I will start with her, and then I will go to the teacher, Marilyn. All righty. Hello again, D.C. State Board of Education and viewers. Oh, my name is Marilyn Holmes, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today to talk about Total Sunshine. Uh, Total Sunshine is a nonprofit locally, 501c3. Uh, we've been around for 18 years serving the community and students as well. I'm a paramedic locally also, and just as a side note, I just got a 20 years of service thing from the national body. I'm so happy about that. Ooh. I can't believe it's been 20 years, but thanks. All righty, so not only am I a paramedic medically, of course, in the medical community, I'm a medic to society. That's the hashtag we've been using for quite some time. Our school grade incentive program through Total Sunshine Inc., we have given more than 670 DC valedictorians and salutatorians laptops or tablets for college, and I'm so happy that we've been able to do that. Uh, there's a huge need for tech tools for young people to make sure that they succeed in Total Sunshine. We feel that need. Um, let's see. Our school grade incentive program also does seminars in schools, anti-violence, life coping skills, anti-bullying, HIV AIDS awareness. Uh, we have actually had a lag in the seminars because of funding. However, we're looking uh, for next month actually for some deserving students to reward for good behavior and great grades. And uh, this is basically an extension of our school grade incentive program and activities that we uh, provide there. So if anyone knows of some students that we can come and surprise uh, with some technolo technological tools and things that um, you know they may need, please get in touch with Total Sunshine. Um, last June, this past June, we had our 10th annual Total Sunshine School Grade Reward Ceremony. Oh my goodness. We had all these valedictorians and salutatorians in there and we were applauding them and the ones of you that were there to help us applaud them. We really appreciate you to, uh, for coming out and giving your words of encouragement and wisdom to these young people. Of course, the 11th annual Total Sunshine School Grade Reward Ceremony is uh, scheduled Saturday, June the 15th, uh, 2019. So we're going to be looking for every single valedictorian and salutatorian from DC public and charter schools to come on, get your laptop, get your applause, and get uh, as many things as we can actually find. Um, this year we were actually able to give out some scholarships to some deserving students, the Lockridge Foundation. I was really happy that we were able to make that connection, and we're looking to make connections with anyone who is willing to support a valedictorian. Now we know these students 
they deserve support. Um, and just because someone gets straight A's doesn't mean that they have the resources from home that are necessary to help them to succeed in their college years. So 100% Total Sunshine Inc., we are there to support them, and we welcome anyone who wants to know more about our school grade incentive program. They can go to totalsunshine.org. They can call us up on the Sunshine Line at 202-575-0462. And um, we'll look forward to applauding the 2019 DC valedictorians and salutatorians. Hashtag medic to society. That's our thing all over social media. And I also just state that I'm still on the Martin Luther King uh, Parade Committee. We're looking forward to a fantastic peace walk and parade once again. Hashtag MLK Holiday DC. Thank you so much for this opportunity to come and share this good information. And students can volunteer for community service hours through Total Sunshine for the Martin Luther King effort, as well as just get in touch with the committee. I'm on the committee several years. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. O'Leary. Exhale. Okay. I'm so happy to be here with one of my former students. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> as someone who spent 47 years as an English teacher in DCPS at the junior high and high school level, I would like to bring my perspective on teacher retention and why the turnover is so dramatic. I was extremely fortunate to have a tremendous cooperating teacher when I did my student teaching at Gardner Patterson Junior High School. I didn't realize until I was hired right after I graduated and began teaching in the same school how much Britannia Capers did to make my student teaching experience a springboard to my employment. As a student teacher, everything I tried was a success. Then I became a real teacher and everything I tried was less than a success, much less. That summer it dawned on me that the difference was the fact that she wasn't in the room. Mentors mean everything to young teachers and administrators. As a veteran teacher, I tried to be there for any young teacher and continue in that role in my retirement. However, there seems to be a lack of an instrument that pairs new teachers with veterans who can offer them invaluable advice about big and small issues that can, left untreated, cause extreme teacher dissatisfaction. If veteran teachers feel overwhelmed by too many out-of-classroom meetings and reports, one can only imagine how new teachers must feel. There needs to be a process for new teachers to be able to crawl before they can walk, or they will run out of that system. This process should be utilized for new administrators too. Retired teachers and administrators are not being utilized in roles where they can share their expertise and experience. Rookies at any level need veteran help. The one thing that people sometimes forget about is something I learned long ago as a new father. 48 years ago. You can't teach experience. You have to experience it. Our teachers need mentors who can help them make it through the first years of what we hope is a lifetime experience. The State Board of Education could take the lead in initiating a policy for comprehensive mentor programs for its teachers and administrators. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boots. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, and I also want to start by thanking um, you guys for even bringing up the teacher retention topic. I think it's super important. And I really do appreciate uh, Mary Levy, who will be talking her, her study and her research years over years, and including this one. Super helpful. Um, so we read the study, Empire, sorry, I'm the executive director, for those who don't know, executive director of Empire K-12, a local nonprofit that supports schools with using data. Um, we dug into the, the report a little bit and tried to, um, try to tease out, like, because we know that the district has a high transient rate, transiency rate, and we wanted to know, like, did that, does that have any correlation or relation to some of the stuff that we're seeing in terms of the teacher retention data? Um, 
we do have, uh, we did find that, like, m although Mary wasn't able to, like, didn't talk about whether there was statistically significant difference in terms of our re uh, retention rates compared to other urban areas, we did look at that data and think that the, our single one year within school retention rates are statistically significantly lower than the urban average. Um, but our five year, um, like this, to the teachers who are staying in our system for five years is not statistically significantly different than the um, national urban average. And so then we went in and looked at some of the transiency reports and data, uh, uh, institutions who use the American Community Survey and use um, some of the data from the IRS to like tease apart what is our transiency in the district. And we do have a higher um, two-year transiency rate than other urban areas in the nation. But actually, the number of uh, individuals who come to the district and then stay five years later isn't that much different than the urban average um, across the nation. So it does seem that like our teacher retention rates are sort of in line with our general transiency data itself. Um, another, um, we looked at also our bold performance schools. Schools, I think you guys are aware, are schools that serve high percentage of at-risk students who also have a, um, achievement rates significantly higher than similar schools. And um, they have single year attrition rates that were anywhere from six to 46 percent. Um, we also looked at the four schools who have effectively closed the achievement gap where their at-risk students have achievement rates above the not at-risk achievement rates in the District of Columbia. And their three-year average one-year attrition, attrition rates, teacher attrition rates were 35 percent, 21 percent, 19 percent, and 26 percent. So um, it, it is, it's substantial. Like I think it, we just do have transiency in the district, but I think it's really worth like digging further into, the, like you said, uh, Ms. Williams, like digging further into the data, doing more research to figure out if we do have higher transiency in the first couple of years, like are these schools that are closing the achievement gap really pulling more out of their teachers that they do have while they do have them than others? And that, that we think is the important, um, one of the important things to look at moving forward. Thank you. Mrs. Ms. Estrada. Ms. Griswold. Emily Griswold. Emily Griswold. From Stanton. Okay, I'm sorry. Emily okay. Griswold. <laughs> Wrong name. Uh, hi, all. Thank you for having me tonight. My name is Emily Griswold, um, and I work at uh, DC Scholars Stanton Elementary. Um, I've been a teacher in DCPS for the past seven years. Um, and I'm here to talk about retention because about three years ago to this day, I almost quit this profession. Um, the reason why I almost quit was because I suffered a mental breakdown. Um, I was in the middle of going to school full time, studying, working with students with emotional behavior disturbance um, while teaching full time in that same setting. Um, and when that happened, I was plagued with panic attacks, um, severe anxiety, as well as insomnia. Um, and because of those things, it launched a self-care revolution in my own life, um, which is kind of what I'm here to talk about today. Um, so the reason why I even went into that field in the first place of working with students with emotional behavior disturbance is because while working at Walker Jones, which is a local public elementary school, um, I saw so many of my students facing adverse childhood experiences and high levels of trauma, um, but I felt like I didn't have the skills to manage and be able to help them become um, the students that I knew that they could be. So I went back to school. Um, but what I recognized during that year of a lot of tumultuous emotions was that I was ingesting that secondary trauma. Um, and there was no way for me to navigate that um, because I did not have a self-care routine and I certainly wasn't being provided it when I was in the school every day. Um, with that being said, uh, I started my own self-care revolution um, through practices like yoga, meditation, and mindfulness, and also a very consistent therapy routine, um, and found that that in itself was really helpful in mitigating those effects of working with students uh, that are at risk every single day. Um, what I recognized also during that year and through my practices is that the demands of teaching aren't changing anytime soon. Um, although many policyholders would say that that would definitely help teacher stress, and I will totally agree with them, uh, right now those things aren't going to happen overnight, and so therefore I had to change my relationship to the work that I do every day. Um, the way that I changed the nature of that relationship was to make sure that I was taking care of myself first and foremost, both during the school day and outside of school. 
Um, so some of these sustainable habit changes are things that we can easily implement. Um, Tish Jennings, who is a researcher at UVA, is doing a lot of interesting work right now about teacher stress. Um, she's found some really unfortunate data about how teachers suffer from um, a lot of stress-induced health concerns, such as strokes and heart disease, um, mostly because of the high rates of stress that we have to endure every day. Um, but the good news is that she's found a lot of really simple techniques that are very cost-effective that we could integrate into the school day to help take care of teachers, which then therefore will help take care of students. Um, so at Stanton, uh, we've started the ball rolling. Um, we were able to get a donor's choose to fund Minds, which is a local nonprofit organization that, teachers, um, that teaches teachers mindfulness and meditation. They come in once to twice a week. Um, I've also initiated a program called Stress-Free Friday, um, which it teaches like dance and therapy to teachers every single Friday for about 45 minutes just to um, mitigate those secondary, that secondary trauma that we experience. Um, there's other things going on around our neighborhoods as well. Um, places like E.L. Haynes have established a wellness coordinator, um, and I think positions like that could really do a great job of mitigating secondary trauma. Um, so with my final words, I just want to leave you with a quote that one of my favorite um, colleagues, Melissa Bryant, once said, which is, people are people because of people. Um, and so to me, it's time that we put the um, human back in the educator and the joy back in learning. And I thank you for taking the time to listen today. Can I add and thank Mary that Stanton Elementary was a, a bold performance school this year. So, thank you. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Just to tell you, I, I taught at Stanton, so I understand. Um, are there questions from the members? Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, and thank you all for coming to testify today. Ms. Griswold, I'm really interested, obviously, um, in, in the work that, that you all are leading at Stanton in terms of um, self-care for teachers. What's the participation been like for educators in the building progressively as, as these opportunities have become available? Yeah, so um, I think the, the nature of self-care, it's like the word of 2018. So I think a lot of people were excited about it when we started offering it. Um, but what I will say is, and I have this a little bit in my longer written testimony, um, the teachers that are participating in these events are very obviously impacting the students that they work with. Um, it's like through anecdotal information, but things like those teachers that uh, come to Stress-Free Friday on a consistent basis um, are seeing like higher levels of student achievement in their classes. Um, they're the teachers who are smiling and coming to work more often and not needing to call out because they're sick. Um, we are, want to take very uh, reasonable data on that, um, but right now participation is at about um, 15 to 20 participants every single Stress-Free Friday um, and about 20 to 25 at the Minds organization. Um, so with a building that employs about mm, 70 or so staff, 60 to 70 staff, it's a really good percentage rate for a first year. No, that's great. Thank you. And, uh, and I guess just generally, do you have any thoughts in the time I have remaining? Do you have any thoughts about how, and I know Stanton got a grant to do it, and, and obviously as a community school has leveraged the, the resources around you to really lead this work. Um, it, do you think that there's a way or do you have any thoughts about how DCPS or our systems in general could implement this more systemically or broadly, a way we could build it into PD or it, do you think it's possible and, and do you have any thoughts about how we could do that? Yeah, I think um, PD is the perfect way. A lot of the surrounding districts where many teachers are leaving to go to um, are already doing this. Um, during their professional development, a large portion of the time is dedicated to staff wellness. Um, and these are in districts that don't even see the same levels of adverse childhood experiences and trauma that we do here in DC. So I think that's a very easy first step, right? The time is already set aside, the money is there. Um, why not take a chunk of that and make sure that our teachers are well? Um, I think a second way to do that is to, through the community schools initiatives, which is perfect, um, is just leveraging any of the community partners that we have. DC is a nonprofit mecca, <laughs> um, and there are so many people who are ready and willing to help, and starting to leverage some of those connections, I think, could be a really easy way to start integrating it and imp most importantly, into the school day, right? Not adding an additional requirement to like meet after school or those kind of things, uh, as fun as those are. Uh, we would love to make sure that teachers are taken care of while they're in the school building. And I think, yeah, those are simple ways to do that. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you.
Um, which one? Does it matter which one I use? There's just a multitude of mics here. This is not our normal place. <laughs> um, so I want to. Um, so I'm going to say Jack and I are sharing some questions. So anyway, I'm going to start with Josh, um, and I just wanted to ask you some questions about the data. So if, if I was trying to follow what you were saying, if I'm understanding, you're saying that our one-year retention rate is substantially lower than national, and our two-year is, but not our three-year and our five-year? Or did I have that backwards or completely wrong? Statistically significantly lower um, in terms of like the actual, is it, is it different than the average? And yes, and it's lower than the average. The, uh, for the one, for the-, the re, But for the, the, the turnover is lower or the retention is lower? The, yeah, the, attri the retention rates are lower. Okay, so the turnover the rates are year, higher. The single for the school, like the, the percent of student, or the percent of teachers who are leaving um, DCPS schools um, in the first, after, like after one year is uh, lower, is <laughs> the retention rate is lower than the urban average, but the percent of teachers who are staying five or more years um, is not um, statistically significantly lower than the urban average. So the, but the one year, I'm gonna call it turnover. So the one year is higher than yes. regular. And, and the three year is? The, Five year. Okay, I thought, and you didn't raise three year. It's just uh, the one I was year. just looking at um, the the study that Mary referenced Got had okay. one year and five right. year. Okay, and then the other thing that you were saying was in the and you also gave a set of numbers for the lowest performing schools. So you're saying, and do they follow the same pattern? Uh, well, I was looking at schools that are actually those are our bull performance schools. Oh, okay. I thought. All right. Yes, and then the four schools that I was talking about are schools that have where the at-risk students have achievement rates higher than the non-at-risk students in our city, and those one those average one-year attrition rates were 35, 21, 19, and 26 percent over the last three years. Their average one-year rate. Yes. Okay. Attrition rate. Okay. Thank you. Um, and m my colleague from Ward 3 and I are sharing questions, and this is for Mr. Boots and um, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, do you have any examples of successful mentorship programs, either in DCPS or the charters, or perhaps outside of DC, that we could look to as an example or a best practice? I'm a member of an organization called the School Club. It was founded 107 years ago by a group of teachers. Uh, Francis L. Cardozo was one of the founders of the school club. And the school club is a group of, of former superintendents, former administrators. Um, there's one teacher on the school club roster, that's, and I, I am he. Uh, and we, we, are, we have been trying desperately over the last 10 years to uh, join with DCPS to mentor teachers and especially administrators because almost all of the people, everybody except me, is a former administrator uh, or an active administrator and in schools all around the metropolitan area. But everyone started with DCPS. But we haven't had a whole lot of success in, in getting anyone to buy into it. I mean, there's a perfect example of a group of, of veteran uh, educators who are dying to share their wisdom. Uh, I guess that's a perfect example of it. I don't know of anything going on in DCPS where uh, they have, I know that there's some principals that are mentors for other principals, active principals for newer principals, but I don't know of anything from outside. Right now, I'm a consultant with DCPS. I'm running a workshop tomorrow at, uh, for AP teachers. But um, that's still, uh, it was almost, I had to twist a whole lot of arms to get that. And I'm, I'm ready to work uh, as a retired person. And uh, Mr. Jacobson, I don't have a specific answer, but I do know that when we went in and did our 
when we went and studied the bold improvement schools uh, at the end of last year and did our report, one of the things that we found when we, because we went in and we toured, we interviewed principals, teachers, staff of, of all those schools that were bold improvement schools. And what we found is that to some certain extent, like this work isn't necessarily revolutionary. The, right, the teachers were basically saying things that, like they, they loved working there because they know, loved, trusted, and respected their leader who know, knew, loved, trusted, and respected them. And, and so like, I think that some of the things that they were, they work hard, play hard, they were also like, when we talk about growth mindsets for students, they had the same thing for their uh, professional staff as well. Right, celebrate, like coming up with goals, celebrating when they met, when teachers met those goals. And so, and so it doesn't surprise to me that like Stanton, who is a new bold performance school for us, is doing things that make their teachers want to feel healthy and loved. So that doesn't surprise me. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I, re I work with a lot of unions in my day job, and we do a lot of apprenticeship and training work, and it does work. Uh, that's why the building trades do that sort of work, um, is because it's nice to have someone that you can lean on and respect and, and turn to with questions. And uh, I appreciate you coming and spending your evening with us. Thank you. And I'm out of time, unfortunately. If I might just add one thing. I, uh, my advice to new teachers was always never go to the teacher's lounge. All right, because the teacher's lounge is where everyone talks about Johnny and Jill and everything like that. But, but it's, it's so important to, to use, you know, if you talk about the village, especially veteran teachers. Now, I was obviously a, uh, an outlier as a veteran teacher because there weren't too many teachers that lasted for 47 years, but I enjoyed 47 years. And, and there are a lot of teachers that would love to be asked to mentor new teachers because new teachers don't know anything uh, seriously. I mean, they know that they know their subject, but you know, you walk in the door, and it's a whole new ball game. And they need they need someone to support them, and the veteran teachers and and retired people are those that can support them. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, thank you all. Uh, Ms. Griswold, I want to start with you. Um, i have in the schools a lot, and I think just one of the barriers I've heard from teachers and administrators implementing pro programs like you are um, doing at Stanton is the scheduling. How are you scheduling these things so that teachers can participate? Mm -hmm. Uh, so this year we actually changed our schedule. We were an extended day school previously um, and now we are no longer an extended day school. Um, so we have that planning block from 8 to 8.45 Monday through Friday, which has been really helpful in creating these kind of inventive new things to have collaborative time to come together. Um, I think that's the key piece is having collaboration time, having the ability to be able to get together, whether that's for student data, but for us it's for well-being. Um, so that's kind of how we we structured the schedule um, and then outside of that um, we just we'd have to get creative um, we have to find ways to plug pieces in um, I know that for me last year when we didn't have that block it was running through everybody's schedule and saying like can you meditate for 20 minutes at this time great I'll be right, there right. Um, but I think and no opposition from school administration of using that block for these purposes no because school administration is participating Okay. Um, last year, all three administrators came to one of my stress relief sessions, and they might be embarrassed of me telling this, but they fell asleep <laughs> um, <laughs> because they were so stressed that they needed that relaxation time. Um, so they're totally on board, which allows me and other creatives to be able to do the work that we're doing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Boots, I wanted to ask you a question. Last week, you had a couple of tweets around um, some of the retention data not being accurate in the report because we were talking about teachers leaving the city versus staying within the community. And I just want to clarify that the percentages that you put out today would be staying in the same school, um, not transferring across systems or within the system. So I think what parents really want to understand is, are our teaching forces stable? Are students going to have the same teacher day after day, and in some cases year after year? Uh, yeah, the, the numbers I talked to about today after further learning from Mary what the focus of the report was in terms of like the within school retention rate, um, that's what I focused on in terms okay. of my comments today. Um, yes, my, my tweets were talking about like 
I am still curious, and I think that that's why we need further research. We yeah. need like a longitudinal database. Like, are teachers, are effective teachers who are leaving DCPS, are they staying in our city, in our system? Yeah. Um, yep. Or, and same thing for ineffective teachers. Are, are we passing around ineffective teachers? So, Correct. like, Com but completely yeah, but, agree. I yeah. just wanted to be clear today, on yes, what you because, were and, referencing and thanks today. Thanks to, to Mary for helping clarify what the nature of the study was, and I appreciated that. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you uh, for testifying. Um, we'll call up the next panel now. Thank oh, you so much. Karen, before you said, I, I just want. I just wanted to thank Josh for the. Um, you just turned it off. I'm having a hard time. I just wanted to thank Josh for the numbers that show that there's this distinction between the one year and the uh, and the five year. I didn't get to say it, and I wanted to say that. For our second panel, will Benjamin Williams, Rachel Burgess. Burke Steyer, I'm sorry. Um, Ryan Torini. Torini and, and Candace Barber. I have to say the 30 seconds thing again. <coughs> okay. I will give the speech again. You have 30 minutes. Thirty-three minutes. Whoa, I'm not staying here all night. Okay, we have th you have three minutes to speak this evening. Please note that you must use the microphone to turn on your microphone. Press, press the button on the base. You will also see a timer in the center of the witness table. The light will be green for the first two and a half minutes. Will turn yellow for the last thirty seconds, and will will turn red after three minutes have lapsed. You can start from my right, your left, just you. And you can begin. Introduce yourself and you can begin. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Candace Barbara. I am a ninth grade English teacher at Cardoza Education Campus. I have been teaching for four years, three of which were in Charlotte, North Carolina. I am here to shed some light on teacher turnover rates and offer a solution that works best for us all. In my brief experience teaching here in DC, I have been absolutely appalled by the treatment of teachers through the impact system and its devastating effects on my students. My students who are already at risk enough deserve teachers functioning at their very best. But how can they under the impact system? Instead, the pressures of impact cause teachers to be on edge, fearing deductions that could cost them their job. We teach the, to the impact system and not to the students' needs, and that is a major problem. The large bonus is used as bait, which creates an environment of high anxiety and stress. How can teachers effectively educate their kids if they don't feel secure in their employment? Students are often asking, will you be here next year? Or, I've never had a teacher stay at my school for longer than a few years. This is a startling trend among students across DC public schools. This impact system requires teachers to exhibit superhuman-like qualities with little regard to the impact, no pun intended, on the teachers themselves. There is so much time wasted checking off the requirements of impact instead of planning and working directly with students to the point where many teachers often lose their planning periods to impact-related activities. Teachers' time is not being centered around students, which is just another reason impact negatively affects their learning. It is no wonder our test scores are so low. Impact makes teachers feel that they are not trusted to do their jobs. They spend so much time checking us that we feel pressure to do something for the sake of impact, not because it will benefit the students and their learning. I love what I do. I am an incredible teacher, to be honest, but this impact system has already made me question whether my mental health is worth, worth risking to remain in the classroom. Quoted directly from the release report on the DC turnover rates, the jarring fact is teacher turnover is higher in the District of Columbia than in other comparable American cities and is higher than the national average. I can directly correlate this to the impact system. 
Teachers cannot and will not be able to successfully educate the next, next generation of American citizens, voting citizens, if they are trapped under a punitive system such as impact. It is my recommendation that a new evaluation system, one where principals have longer contracts and teachers aren't treated so strictly, be implemented in the 2019-2020 school year. Then we can focus on what's important, our students, their futures, and their education. Thank you for your time. Uh, hello, good evening, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Ben Williams. Uh, I'm a high school social studies teacher at Capital City Public Charter School in DC. Uh, <clears throat> in my teaching career of seven years, I've taught at the elementary, middle, and high school levels, and I'm currently in my fifth year of teaching in the district. This past weekend, I gave a presentation with five other district educators on our solution-oriented approach to minimizing turnover in the district. I am here today to continue to advocate for change on behalf of my peers in both traditional public and public charter schools and as a member and teacher leader of the Empower Ed Teacher Turnover Action Committee. I would like to talk today about three things. First, my peers and I believe that a vision-driven leadership model is needed to improve school culture. It will also improve teacher morale and lower teacher turnover in the district. In vision-driven leadership schools, teachers and administrators follow a four-step process to drive school improvement. This can include identifying the needs of the student body, a subset of the student body, the instructional culture of the school, but it's done together. Next, teachers and administrators collaborate and agree upon these problems and how and why they should be addressed. This allows for authentic buy-in, not top-down management decisions, and for school initiatives to improve um, collaboration amidst individuals within the school building. All parties involved then create a collective vision this can be oriented around any of the issues I named previously. To be successful, the fourth pillar involves applying the principle of shared ownership and distributive leadership. This component is critical in order to respect the expertise that teachers possess and harness our talents to make a positive impact in our schools, all the while uh, having the support of our school leaders. Next, I'd like to talk about the need to effectively support teachers and to differentiate that support appropriately. In my first couple of years teaching in the district, I needed someone I could trust to discuss ideas, share thoughts around my teaching practice, and gain management and instructional strategies in an efficient manner. At Two Rivers Public Charter School, I was surrounded by veteran teachers, and their support in my first couple of years made an overwhelming and demanding job more manageable. We need to look closely at how we're supporting new teachers. The National Commission on Teacher in America's Future decries that nearly 50% of teachers leave the profession within the first five years. Mentorship won't be a possibility if we don't change this trend. Mentorship is a necessary support, as previously indicated, uh, for ensuring that teachers have support from people who understand the role and responsibilities and can give feedback and advice based on that understanding. Finally, I believe that we need to be more creative in retaining our best teachers and educators and making the job less overwhelming and more sustainable for educators to stay in schools for the long haul. Not all teachers want to move on to positions of administration, and given that teachers are the number one school impact uh, on student achievement, more needs to be done to retain our best educators. I'll close by saying that more creative solutions are needed and that we need to lessen the stress, the overall well-being, and target our policies at the conditions um, for educators to be able to do our jobs to the best of our abilities. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Tariainen. I have been an educator for at-risk at students for 11 years, and I'm really glad that the council is taking up uh, the important topic of teacher retention in Washington, D.C. I was saddened, but unfortunately not shocked to see some of the results that came out of the study. Um, as we know, some of our schools will lose over half of their faculty within five years. Um, so a student starting at a school in kindergarten may have a totally different staff by the time they're in fifth grade, and that's unacceptable. Even prior to this study, the Washington Post put out an expose in June of 2017 that detailed how schools such as Ballou High School were losing up to 25% of their staff before the end of one year. Many of the teachers were quitting mid-year, leaving the students with long-term substitutes. Therefore, the students who needed the most resources were getting the least. The results of the most recent study are clear, that one of the most important aspects for our teachers is who they work for, namely their principal. As I speak to teachers throughout the district, consistently it is the principal that is one of the most critical factors in what keeps teachers in their classroom 
or plot their exit. I currently support first year teachers in DC and Prince George's County as adjunct staff for Johns Hopkins School of Education. And consistently the teachers who do not make it past year one are those who bemoan their principals using words such as weak, unsupportive, cruel, hidden, or inept. I believe the main problem is a lack of development and preparation for our principals who must lead our toughest schools. On the occasion that a school has a strong leader, that person is often plucked from the principal's office and put in the district office. And unfortunately, their expertise is not always easily transferred to their colleagues. Often their replacement is unable to thrive in their same building. In DC, it is not uncommon to meet a teacher or instructional coach who was once a principal, but were later fired or demoted. I work with two such people now. Both are clearly talented educators, but perhaps did not have the skills to lead a school. Too many schools are banking that those skills are innate without the need for training. So perhaps in addition to the teacher turnover, we need to add principal turnover to the conversation just as much. As a, just as a struggling teacher will have poor results, so too will a struggling leader. I was a principal in Washington, D.C. for several years, and I was D.C.'s principal of the year in 2016, so I feel like I have a lot to say about this, up, this subject. I never lost a teacher mid-year, and most of my staff stayed with me every year that I was principal. I felt prepared to be their leader because I had the benefit of intense training, a master's program, and consistent professional development. But none of those programs were offered by our public school systems or the charter schools. I had to seek them myself through outside organizations. I wonder how much of our retention in both the classroom and the office would be better if we directly offered, if not required, similar training to all principals in their first through fifth year. I would also implore the board to research the results from the new teacher project surveys that are given to most of our schools in the district, TNTP Insight Surveys, which my schools gave twice a year. They are able to locate the model schools that place in the 75th percentile or higher, and those schools can be representative of what works and what leadership works um, in the district. Hi, Rachel Bursiger with American Friends Service Committee, DC Peace and Economic Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment. American Friends Service Committee DC would like to urge the board to consider initiating the revision process of DC's social study standards with a particular emphasis on incorporating human rights and humanitarian law principles. In 2008, DC became the first human rights city in the United States. And yet 10 years later, city leadership has not institutionalized the city's commitment to a culture of human rights by educating our citizens about these issues. American Friends Service Committee DC can attest to the impact and benefit of human rights education. Since 2009, AFSC DC has ran our Human Rights Learning Project, um, where we have offered human rights education workshops to over 800 DC PES students. As a direct result of this engagement, youth participants have increased their leadership and advocacy skills and demonstrated a positive attitude towards mobilizing and community engagement. Our curriculum culminates in a capstone project where students are asked to identify local human rights violations and design action projects to address these violations. This past spring, students at Anacostia High School identified a number of issues with their school and or school system that they believe were in violation of their human rights. Students from Mrs. Brandy Bird's world history class composed letters addressing these concerns ranging from academic rigor to unsanitary facilities, and I've provided copies of those letters along with my testimony. This activism is a direct result of exposure to human rights education. When young people learn about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they are more likely to promote tolerance, social justice, and a culture of peace because they understand that all human beings have human rights and human dignity. It's a tragedy that every student in DC does not receive this type of instruction. And one day these students will lead our city. It is in the best interest of the district that they do so through a human rights lens. The right to education is protected by the 26th Amendment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. However, this right does not only encompass the right to receive an education, but it further entitles all to an education that is directed towards the strengthening of respect for human rights. 
To date, the responsibility for providing this right to our DC students has fallen to AFSC and other like-minded organizations. It's now time for our city's leadership to fulfill their commitment under the 2008 resolution to become a human rights city and take proactive steps to address pervasive and persistent right, rights violations, including the absence of human rights education. Uh, in closing, AFSC DC exhorts the District of Columbia State Board of Education to update the social studies standards, taking stock of our city's commitment to human rights and become human rights allies so that our city can implement human rights ideals in a way that is specific to the needs and concerns of our community. The District of Columbia has long been a leader in human rights at the national level. Let us cement this leadership position through alignment of educational standards with our values as a human rights city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bergsier. Really appreciate your testimony. Uh, and thank you all for your testimony. Um, members, are there questions? Okay. Ms. Carter. It's okay. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. I do have a couple quick follow-up questions for Ms. Uh, Barbara. Uh, you said this is your fourth year teaching uh, overall and your first year in the district, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay, um, really quickly, uh, you were in, in Charlotte, were you actually in the urban area or were you in the outside um, suburban areas? So Charlotte is a very interesting city because there's actually where the epicenter is where the actual skyscrapers, there's no schools at all. All of the schools themselves are urban schools, Title I on the outskirts. So we actually had very many busing problems and gerrymandering when it comes down to the district zones for students to get to where they needed to be. So students would bus for almost two hours from the opposite side of town in, um, and to the school that I was at, all Title I, all high at risk students. Okay, that, that actually is another follow up question that I wanted. Um, so you talk about you don't you dislike impact um can you talk about your uh teacher evaluation system in charlotte and or what you would recommend as some changes to impact and or another evaluation system absolutely one thing i did really like about the evaluation system in charlotte was the fact that teachers had meetings with their um, assistant principals and they had different assistant principals evaluating them at three different times where they could advocate for themselves and provide evidence supporting why they believe that that score might be unfair and they have to t and the evaluator has to take detailed notes of everything going on mm -hmm. so they can't just walk in and just take a few notes stay there for 20 to 30 minutes they had to stay there in Charlotte it was 90 minute blocks for 90 minutes the entirety sit there and take notes the whole time, and then give you the chance to pro provide evidence and explain why you did what you did in your classroom. And there wasn't this huge checklist saying, if you don't do X, Y, and Z outside of what is uh, expected of you from eight to four, you wouldn't be, pu uh, you wouldn't be punished or there wouldn't be a punitive uh, aspect of it. So they recognized that some teachers had lives outside of their job and that some, uh, some teachers had families that they had to go home to or pick up their kids. So it wasn't punitive that they couldn't do an extracurricular. It was understood because they were a human. And so I think incorporating this system to make it more understanding and give more grace to teachers, recognizing that they can't necessarily go above and beyond because that bonus that is used as bait can be very painful because some people may actually need that money mm -hmm. and they can't help that they have to go and take care of their child or pick them up from daycare. So then it's kind of a slap in the face when you're sitting there like, oh, well, I couldn't go do a home visit with my student because I had to go pick up Johnny at daycare. So I think it's understanding that we're humans and adding that aspect and allowing teachers to advocate for themselves and then having rotating assistant principals come in. It's not the same one every time. So it gives them the chance to have multiple views on a teacher and their job. Thank you. I have one other question. May I go over? And oh. uh, This second question is for uh, Ben and uh, Mr. Tar Tararian. There you go. Um, so both of you talk about collaboration uh, and creative solutions to teacher turnover. Uh, one of the questions that I have for you guys is, um, 
we see that principals create the culture inside of a school. Mr. Uh, Terrarian, I, I'm, I said it wrong again, you being princi a former principal of the year and director of uh, head of a school, um, do you have any creative solutions to and or collaboration, any, any suggestions we can do for uh, principal uh, development and or principal um, uh, to lessen teacher turnover? Uh, yes. So I think that there's, there's a litany of things. Uh, I think some of the most important things is number one, and I'm speaking as with my teacher hat on as well. Um, I know that when I was a teacher, I was looking for a leader who was an instructional leader. So someone who performed well in his or her classroom um, and therefore had the street cred to lead the rest of us into having uh, high performing classrooms. Number two, you gotta have the soft skills. That's like the big part. Um, sometimes we move people from the classroom to the office, but we haven't taught them how to have those soft skills, how to supervise people, how to be fair, um, how to communicate well with adults. You can have a person who's immensely talented leading a group of children, but might not have the confidence to lead a group of adults. Um, and uh, the, the third thing is a lot of things with the school culture, having traditions, um, have, showing appreciation for teachers in multiple ways. Um, and being present, being visible, not being a person who was caught up in the office. I was in my classrooms every single day, um, sometimes all of them on the, in one day, um, even if it was just for five minutes. So that visibility um, plays a huge role too in being supportive. Uh, Mr. Williams, anything to add? Um, thank you. I, I would echo a lot what uh, Mr. Tari Tari Tariainen said, um, I think that it is very different to manage a group of, of kids in a classroom versus lead a building. Um, I also think that culture is shared amongst all the adults in the building and amongst the students. And so that's why I think distributive leadership is so necessary. If there's a top-down initiative and um, it's to raise test scores or it's to do something that teachers don't feel valuable, there's not going to be buy-in. And there's then going to be resistance and distrust that's created between the teachers and um, the administrators. And so I think by in, in leveraging and understanding that most of the people who are working with kids every day are the teachers and that we understand the needs of the kids the most, we have to have some um, role in determining the focus um, of the instructional culture at the school because um, we need to be able to have the flexibility to adjust our instruction. And I think that begins with trust. And I think based on what I've heard a couple of people say, the trust um, has, has felt like it's been sucked out of the school system. And um, as someone who wants to continue growing as a professional, you don't want to be undermined by what you know is best for uh, your students that are in front of you every day. Thank you very much, and thank you members for allowing me to go over time. Thank you, Madam President, and, and thank you all for being here this evening. I, I think it was really important now, all of your testimony uh, was very important. I'll just say quickly uh, to, to Rachel, thank you for, for that very timely suggestion. Um, I think, you know, now more than ever, we need uh, to really instill in our students from the classroom a respect and passion for fighting for human rights, um, but also uh, a respect and empathy for one another. Um, and uh, I think for two months in a row, we've heard testimony uh, from the well, from the public, uh, saying that we need to take another look at our social studies standards. I think last month's suggestion was around um, boosting our curriculum around African American history and Latinx history. Uh, and so, uh, you know, my hope is that, in, uh, you know, in the new year as we begin to, to to really uh, uh, plan our work for the next year that we take a hard look at that. Um, and to, to Candace, Ben, and Ryan, thank you so much for talking about the development of leadership, um, not only among uh, school administration, but really raising teacher voice uh, and, and boosting teacher leadership, which uh, obviously I think is very important. Uh, but you'll also hear from a lot of principals who, who seem to uh, for 
who seem to hold in their hand the ability to create school culture, uh, that there's still pressure higher than them uh, that really impacts uh, the school culture. And so I think the missing link is, is what we do about the mandates and the pressure that comes from, from central office and, and, and from LEAs uh, that, that could contribute to, to a toxic school culture. And so I would just ask the three of you very quickly, uh, are, do you have any suggestions about how we do that, how we change the culture from the top down so that at the school level, both administrators um, and teachers have the room and the flexibility to grow and create a school culture that really contributes uh, to, to their positive development, to their mental health, and ultimately, and more, most importantly, to, to the growth and nurturing of students. Um, I'll say quickly that um, I don't have a precise response, but I think a general principle that we need to make sure that the mandates that are coming to schools look at achievement holistically and not just based on a test score, and that if we work and focus on enabling teachers, principals, all staff to maximize learning, um, then the test scores will take care of themselves. And so I think thinking more broadly about achievement will help take some of that pressure off of principals to direct student and teacher actions um, to prepare for a test rather than to prepare for you, the future. I think also looking at the students' experiences, especially our students that are high risk um, schools, our Title I's, our students who are coming, um, to school not because they want to learn necessarily, but to get those bottom levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, to get food, to get the basic attention that they want that they no, might not necessarily get at home. If we are so focused on a test score or we're so focused on giving principals only a one-year contract where they're so stressed out, it kind of trickles down and then kids feel it and they feel, well, I'm not good enough, I'm not getting a good test score. I had a student today who sat in a meeting and he said, Miss Barbara, I have a third grade reading level and I'm in your ninth grade class. He's like, I might as well just drop out. He's like, the lawyer sitting right here is saying that I'm not smart enough to be here. And I'm like, that's what a test is saying. What about your mindset going in the test? What about what you experienced this past weekend that might still be on your mind? At the end of the day, we can't just look at a kid for their test score. We have to look at them as an entire human being and really think about what they're experiencing. Because those traumas, whether we like it or not, kind of cloud our ability to be successful on an exam and these exams are not necessarily designed for students in general. I took the park exam and I'd like to say I'm a master's student at Johns Hopkins as well. And I'd like to boast that I'm highly intelligent and the park exams very much exhausted me. So I can't imagine a 15 year old who has gone through a lot in their life and they're probably a little hungry, tired, and then they have to sit there and take the, those exams over a course of a few days. I can understand how that's not representative of the whole child and how that could really impact a culture at a school because everyone from the top down is going to feel negative. Thank you. And I'll just quickly say, um, you were talking about looking at like from the top down. And in my experience and from what I've read, the, the two issues that will get a principal out of their school, number one is frustration with the central office and all the constraints are put upon that principal. And number two is a lack of support with dealing with um, what we'll call difficult parents, which can be a huge uh, burden of stress on a principal who's often the gatekeeper for their teachers. Um, but what I'll say is what principals look for is very similar to teachers. Just like teachers look for a leader who's gonna be present and know his or her kids personally, principals are looking for a superintendent or whatnot who knows their school intensely um, and provides that support. And I think sometimes there's a lot to be left to improve there from the central office. Yes. Um, so my first question is for um, Ms. Barbara. So you talked about um, the experience of trying to teach while also being evaluated, I guess, and that you had to do things, or maybe even when an evaluator isn't there, that you felt pressured to do things for the impact evaluation that weren't the right things for the kids. And I wonder if you could just talk to us, describe a little bit about what some of those things might be, because I don't think people very much understand what that evaluation system looks like. 
Um, absolutely, and I have to say that some of this is also coming from my colleagues. So I sat down with a lot of my trusted uh, colleagues that I work with on my ninth and 10th grade team, and I asked them, where are you struggling? And, uh, and across the board, it was impact. And they, when we look at the tasks and the data and implementing this test on this day, the constantly with the ANET exams and implementing them so often, we don't even get the chance to really look at the data. We're just told to implement it because that's this is the date that the district wants us to implement it. We got to check it off the box. It could be also visiting the student homes. You have certain times that you can do that and they want them done by a certain amount before you can get um, that score of a four on your CSC. So it's very difficult to manage all of that and coming as a new teacher, coming into this, those are things that I did because I knew that's what I had to not because I was gonna get evaluated on it, but because I knew I wanted to get to know my students and what their home life was like. But having it on a checklist, you tend to see people are just going and saying, well, I went to their house, I knocked on the door, they weren't there, check, and it's to check it off. It's not because I genuinely wanna know why a student is not showing up. I genuinely wanna check on their well-being. And that creates this culture of just checking things off of a box. So those are just a few of the things that I've noticed, and that's not going into even um, the nitty gritty, how many events are you gonna show up at after school, right? Because there are teachers who show up to a, an event after school for five minutes, they're like, let me, let me get a quick picture so that they know I was here and then go. And it's not because they don't wanna interact, but because they've got so much else on their plate that this is the last thing that they feel like they can truly engage in because of how it's presented to them as a punitive system instead of a, well, you're already doing this, let's make sure that you really earn that good score. Um, I only have 22 seconds, so I'll pass. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Tatiana Robinson, and um, I'm the student representative specifically. I'm a senior at Baloo High School. And um, first, I wanted to say thank you for coming to share with us. But um, while we look at the um, scores and see how much teacher retention it is, we must know like the real reasons why teachers are leaving. And I thank y'all for coming to share some of that. But um, I think that it's also that we must recognize that some teachers leave not because of um, some of those things, but also because they just aren't used to the environment. For example, we have a lot of first year teachers come to Baloo and um, they just leave because they aren't used to the environment. So my first question is, um, when you find out that other teachers are not prepared for like the student, the different student populations, except, I mean, especially in urban settings, are there, do you know if there are supports in place to ensure that they receive the appropriate support to ensure that they can help the students? Um, I, I can't speak directly to your question, but I think it's a, well, let me pause for a second. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think that uh, I don't know of any particular supports. Um, I think that I would say that making the job in urban education, um, and I have a lot of friends who teach in suburban education, and obviously it's a very different reality in some places, but the job of teaching right now is very hard in terms of the overall workload. And so I think I would just like to raise up again, if, if teachers, whether it be at Baloo or any other school in the district, have those mentor teachers to rely on that can help them manage that manage the workload of the job and be our best selves for students every day, then I think you'll get teachers who want to continue that intrinsic motivation um, to stay in the classroom as to the reasons we got into the classroom in the first place um, and to be able to have that support from people who know the job. So I don't know of any supports outside of the school building, but I think the teachers who you, know, you can depend on to be there year after year are the ones who are best able to support new teachers. And that's where I think like the policy and should be focused and the, the board should consider how we can best retain teachers. Tatiana, I wanna thank you for asking a question and being so engaged. I too was a student representative for my board of education when I was your age and I think that's a great opportunity to really get to know the district that you're learning in. 
um, I have to say, I, I'm a former Teach for America, which usually is like this brand that people have a negative stigma for. I wanted to teach. I didn't know the right way to get there. And so maybe some of the teachers you're referring to might be Teach for America teachers who realize that this profession wasn't for them. And I'm sorry for them because they're missing out on an opportunity to learn every day and shape lives. But I definitely think as a student, that's where you can step in and check in on those teachers and be there for them as well. Because a lot of the times, something that's missing is we forget that our our interactions aren't just with administrators and principals and district members, but with our students. And I challenge students to think about how you can best support and um, invite your teachers to feel comfortable in a school, especially if they kind of stick out and you're like, hmm, you've probably never been in a school like this before. Let me take you under my wing. Because that's what teachers are looking for as well. We all are kind of secretly, at least our first year in my opinion, shaking in our boots and a kindergartner going to school for the first time. We all feel that way, we just don't like to admit it. So thank you, and I really hope that you take that challenge and be there for those teachers. And I'll just quickly add that um, I don't think that there's enough training, if at all, for exactly what you're talking about, Tatiana. And there is an organization, though, in DC, a nonprofit that was started by a local DC principal called the Equity Lab, um, started by Michelle Molitor. And it does fantastic work on exactly what you're talking about. However, people have to seek that help. It's not just automatically provided to everyone. And I would love um, if her organization could be engaged to make that more broadly across the district because I've attended um, her trainings and it's exactly what I think is needed. Thank you, panel. Um, thank you for testifying. I'd like to call the next panel. Mary Nizak, Donna Richard, Dana Richard, Philip Copeland, and Jill Telford. You have three minutes to speak this evening. Please note that you must use the microphone. To turn on your microphones, press the button on the base. You will also see a timer at the center of the witness table. The light will be green for the first two minutes, two and a half minutes, and will turn yellow for the last 30 seconds, and will turn red after the three minutes have elapsed. You can start on this end, introduce yourself, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Philip Copeland. I'm a current teacher, sixth grade or sixth year in Washington, D.C. Um, the beginning of the 2018-2019 school year has been the best start to any year that I've had as an educator. My 101 students have been exceeding the enormous expectations I set for them to start a school year. All four of my classes this year have built a strong culture of learning where everyone is engaged and everyone is supportive of one another. I recently had to make one of the hardest decisions of my life. Um, Friday, October 19th was the last day I had teaching this phenomenal group of students. Teaching these phenomenal group of kids was the easiest part of my job to say the least, which typically is not the case with educators, especially across the district. I explained to my students that the joy I get from teaching them is so rewarding, but it's only one fourth of the job I have as a teacher. I told them that it takes a significant time out of my day to grade all 101 of their assignments, to plan for each of their differentiated lessons to accommodate the needs that they have as individual scholars. I did not tell them that the number of meetings that we had constantly robbed me of the time I needed to grade and plan, and this often would take time away from my family at home, my pregnant wife who's also a teacher, and my two-year-old son. I did tell my students, though, that my two-hour commute was a major factor to me leaving the school. A significant number of teachers from the school last year did not return this year. We lost the entire ninth grade teaching staff in the process. Rather than hiring new people, my school distributed the ninth grade classes to teachers of other grade levels. 
This year, I had to juggle a ninth grade class in addition to the seventh grade classes I originally was hired to teach. Planning and teaching for two different subjects are time-consuming tasks. In addition to the time it took to plan for these new subject areas, the math curriculum writers did not provide a curriculum for the ninth grade until a month into the school year, which you can imagine is an enormous strain on me and the kids. In addition to the obstacles I highlighted, the entire seventh grade team that I was the grade level lead for were all first year teachers, highlighting Ms. Robinson's point before. Um, even though the 101 students that I taught were excelling in my classroom, they were consistently getting in trouble and significant portions of them were failing multiple classes. Um, as a teacher of color, it's absolutely demoralizing to see my students being treated in a similar way that I was in school coming up. And current policies and initiatives that we see always lean towards teacher accountability and their job performance. But we do not see policies that hold local education agencies accountable for the people that they hire or do not hire. Unsustainable workloads and chronic inconsistencies from school leadership are what cause highly effective and passionate teachers like myself from leaving the students that they love behind. I started teaching my new school two days ago, and I hope there are more accountability systems in place where I am now. Thank you. That's sad. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jill, and before I start, I just wanted to ask how everyone is feeling. I always start my classroom day um, asking my students how we're feeling. So I wish everyone well, and <clears throat> I'm going to be in this time limit. Um, I'm a teacher, and I've been teaching for a decade. During my 10 years, I have witnessed and experienced so much turnover in this field. Most of all, our children and families experience it. It feels like salt to an open wound. We leave due to financial, most of all due to lack of support and freedom to do the right thing for our students, our children. I hear the following phrase often, I close the door and do what's developmentally appropriate right for my students. What does this mean? What does this look like? I dare you to read three books, Developmentally Appropriate Practice, if you haven't, much more than the ABCs, and the fable written in 1940, The Animal School. But it's still applicable to today, and if I have time, I would love to read it. We're so busy readying our children for the next thing that we forget to meet them right where they are. We need to ask, are we ready for them? Are we doing the right thing for children by putting our research into action? in over-reliance on test scores, and teaching to a test is burning teachers and us out, children, us, families, all of us. How is it that standardized testing is linked to funding and performance? Relying solely on data and scores all the while telling our students you are more than a test. Meanwhile, at private schools such as Sidwell Friends, project-based and expeditionary learning are taking place. The right thing happens. I ask when you choose a school, do you look at scores? Or, you do, or do you walk inside to get a feel for the climate and the culture? Instead of asking schools for our scores, ask us how we're feeling. Nationally, how are all of our schools feeling? What are our children showing us? And I think I might have time to read this story. All right. The Animal School by George Rivas. Once upon a time, the animals decided they must do something heroic to meet the problems of a new world, so they organized a school. They adopted an activity curriculum consisting of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. To make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals took all the subjects. The duck was excellent in swimming, in fact, better than his instructor. But he made only passing grades in flying and was very poor in running. Since he was slow in running, he had to stay after school and also drop swimming in order to practice running. This was kept up until his webbed feet were badly worn and he was only average in swimming, but average was acceptable in this school, so nobody worried about that except the duck. The rabbit started at the top of the class in running, but had a nervous breakdown because of so much makeup work in swimming. The squirrel was excellent in climbing until he developed frustration in the flying class, where his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of the treetop down. He also de developed a charley horse from overexertion and then got a C in climbing and a D in running. 
The eagle was a problem child and was disciplined severely. In the climbing class, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but insisted on using his own way to get there. At the end of the year, an abnormal eel that could swim exceedingly well and also run, climb, fly a little had the highest average, and he was valedictorian. The prairie dog stayed out of school and fought the tax levy because the administration would not add digging and burrowing to the curriculum. They apprenticed their children to a badger and later joined the groundhogs and gophers to start a, to start a successful private school. And I just wanted to end there, but yeah, that's it. And thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Um, uh, I guess it's Madam President and uh, board members. Um, I wanted to thank you for this opportunity to provide a statement and um, my statement, uh, testimony and statement, which uh, I'll submit a final version via email, um, centers on a plan for strategic retention of new teachers and school personnel um, and using this opportunity for uh, teacher retention to um, bring skills into the schools that were noticeably missing or are needed under the current circumstances and, and laws and other things that are occurring within the schools. Um, and also, uh, in terms of retention, I wanted to connect it to two recent DC laws. One is the Fair Access to Schools Act and the um, Athletic Equity Act of 2015. Um, the the uh, Fair Access to Schools Act passed May 1st, I believe, 2018. And it replaces um, um, suspensions and expulsions with in-school activities and behavioral support. So it's a it's a pretty significant law if you look at the way things have been done in schools historically in the last 20 years um, with ma mass expulsions and suspensions and at the same time teacher burnout and um, and uh, teacher dropout, if you will. Uh, but that's here and it's gonna continue for at least some time. Um, and so it's an opportunity to bring into the school things that are needed. For example, um, there's no curricular content in DC K through college on, the, on development of mediation and training on mediation, mediation training. And mediation is a primary method of dispute resolution. Um, and whole classes are, uh, whole classes of cases are resolved that way, particularly cases involving minor children. And um, so currently there's no university in DC that has a mediation clinic of any kind. They do exist in Maryland and Virginia, UVA, University of Baltimore, um, University of Maryland, typically at their law schools. But they can also exist within a nursing program or a medical school. And um, there, there's interest, I know, um, from meetings I've had on um, development of a multidisciplinary uh, graduate level uh, family mediation clinic uh, to, to help um, teach students, graduate students, the a primary method of dispute resolution, um, that, it, that it impacts schools and school children, particularly with the passage of the Fair Access to Schools Act, because there's going to be a lot of things that need to be resolved and, you know, with skilled mediators. So, the school board can only advise at the graduate and collegiate level, but um, certainly they're in a position to influence whether um, curricula and certificate programs are offered uh, in mediation uh, in, in the high schools. And um, so, and that could be a valuable resource. 
Um, I have additional information I prepared, but I'll put it all in the safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the board? Just want to say I have a certificate in the mediation from yeah. University of Baltimore, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's getting late, so I know we all want to have fewer questions, but when, when DCPS saw this report, one of their... One of the responses of DC public schools was that they retain a very high number of their highly effective teachers. And the implication was a lot of the teachers who are leaving early, say in this first year, second year, where the numbers are very high, um, aren't effective. And I, I guess aren't gonna be effective would be their argument. Because one thing we do know is from the research that's very solid is that um, teachers gain skill and ability over a course of years. So first year teachers are on average, are on average much less skilled and much less effective than two year teachers. And second year teachers are much less effective on average than third year teachers, up at least until three years, some say five years or eight years. So, but it seems like part of their argument is that they're moving teachers out who weren't gonna be effective. So I guess my question to you is do you think we're doing a poor job in hiring, that we're selecting the wrong people to hire, and that's why so many leave or get pushed out? Or do you think that these are people that could become effective if they were provided the right kind of mentorship and support and training that people have been talking about? So speaking from my experience, um, many of the teachers coming in are not experienced, and they're not necessarily from the area. There's one thing to not be experienced in content level. There's one thing not to be experienced with the communities that you will be a, a part of pretty much as a teacher. Um, I know me in particular, several teachers I've seen come in their first year, they make an immediate connection with their students. Um, you can't teach that. That's just a matter of being in the profession or not. One thing you also see are people who thought about being a teacher, moved from Washington State and decided this is the best thing to do out of college and they're coming in, they're dealing with kids with severe trauma, and they're dealing with kids with severe needs, and they're in schools with high stakes and high stakes testing. The school that I highlighted that I left was actually in the process, it could potentially be closed down this year based off its park scores. And I mentioned before the amount of teachers that left last year to this year, and I just wanna highlight my old school. We were one of nine charter schools in the district that showed double digit gains in math and language arts. So we were showing growth in general, but in that process, they hired first year teachers to take the spots of veteran teachers. On that seventh grade team I was personally a part of, the grade level lead at the time was a doctor. She had a doctorate in teaching. She taught over 10 years and they replaced her with the first year, uh, no disrespect to the person who spoke before, Teach for America individual who just turned 21 in the school year. Um, for me personally, there has to be accountability towards who gets hired. There has to be a more transparent process towards who gets hired, and it has to be, I guess, shown across. I know teacher demographics is not the easiest thing to find in the public charter school sector. I believe you have to request it from IC, and it's not available easily through, I guess, websites that are, are, are available or whatnot. Um, there has to be transparency in that department because it, it, it has a rough impact on the students and the teachers because I believe the district is one of the highest paying like teaching areas in the nation, yet we have the highest like, turnover rate also. So what does that tell you? I think that's still in itself. Yeah, if I may piggyback on that, I think it really deals with relationships and building from within the classroom and out, outward into the community and bringing the community inside and recognizing where you're at in the world. And a lot of the times, it's that disconnection because there's such an emphasis on test scores as well as standardized testing and teaching the content where we need the freedom and the support to say, hey, how are you feeling today? Let's read these stories. So at my current school, we focus a lot on social emotional development and we learn a lot through meaningful play and guided learning. 
Whereas to, I actually, I had, um, got accepted into the Teach for America program, but something within like me, and it, there's nothing wrong, it's, it's doing great work, but with me understanding developmentally appropriate practice, children need more than one minute to respond to a math question. You get what I'm saying? So it's not like, okay, one minute, one minute for five plus five. Okay, you got one minute, one minute. But you guys all have different abilities. You know, so it's like we need to kinesthetically move together. We need to dance together. We need to sing together. We need to ask, how are you feeling? Families need to feel welcomed in the, in the classroom. Language development, you know, home language. From home to seeing their pictures in the classroom. You know, I mean, really, we all need IEPs when you think about it, you know? So um, that, that's, that's all right now, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, Thank all of you. Could I just continue on that point for briefly, right. if I could? We're running tremendously over time. So in our next panel, okay. when we ask, we have to ask succinct questions and we have to get succinct answers. Okay, okay. but go ahead. This is the last oh. one, quickly. Well, in terms of uh, social behavioral support, I mean, the Fair Access to Schools Act, you know, mentioned specifically in school behavioral support and so I wanted to add to that things that are time tested and long time tested in the schools which fitness, nutrition, um, athletics, academics and they're all tied together and um, good healthy rigorous athletics and sports and fitness and nutrition um, curricula and sports and other activities. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank, thank the panel. Um, Wait, Mark, oh. Mark, Mark. Thank you, Madam President. Just really quickly, I, I just wanted to thank you all uh, for, for your contributions as educators. To Mr. Copeland, I want to thank you for, for really speaking to a lot of the things we hear from teachers all the time, uh, namely more time for planning, more time for grading, which obviously, as you know, helps teachers become better teachers and understand uh, their students uh, in a better way. And then you also talked more specifically about your personal struggles with commutes, which is not uh, uh, it, you're not the only one and so we've got to create more opportunities more broadly in our city for our educators to live here uh, in the communities where they teach but I'll, I'll just ask very quickly obviously Mr. Mr. Thank you. I'm, the timer didn't I, get reset. Yeah. He has a couple, he has a minute left. He does. I, yeah. So I, I just wanted to ask very quickly are, the, are there, uh, are there any ways you can see where more of that time could be built in? You, talk about, you talked about cumbersome meetings and, and some of those things that are time sucks, but are there other ways to really, to really give educators more time to do that work? I think it goes, I'll make it quick. I think if we hire more people who's qualified to teach, they should be trusted to do their jobs. The issue is there's so many new teachers on board that they have to create new initiatives to train them along the way. I think we have qualified teachers within the classroom and I think if we trust them to actually do their jobs. You can give them the time to do their jobs then and then you'll see more positive results. The problem in education, we're trying to make cookie cutters out of these people as opposed to relying on their expertise. Good thing we don't do that with doctors and lawyers or we all be sure. <laughs> Appreciate you. Again, thank you. More than four years ago, the, dis the, Cam the Council of the District of Columbia moved the Office of the Ombudsman for Public Education to the State Board of Education and charged us with restoring the office. The State Board appointed Joanna Smith as the first Ombudsman in this revitalized office and during her term, she served hundreds of district families and students while creating processes and procedures that will ensure the office continues successfully. At this time, I would like to welcome a motion on ceremonial resolution 18-9. So moved. Second. Second. The motion being properly moved and seconded, I will ask Mr. Haywood to read the resolution. State Board of Education Ceremonial Resolution to Honor Former Ombudsman for Public Education, Joanna Smith, CR 18-9. 
whereas the District of Columbia State Board of Education applauds the outstanding service that Joanna Smith has provided to the district students and families as the District of Columbia Ombudsman for Public Education from 2014 to 2018. Whereas Ms. Smith used her experience in law and working in a school setting to advocate for the rights of all children in the District of Columbia traditional and char charter public schools. Whereas Ms. Smith founded the Ombudsman's Office with the State Board and developed it into a nationally recognized model for other Ombudsman offices. Whereas Ms. Smith influenced legislative change in the District of Columbia for both special education and discipline. Whereas under Mrs. Smith's leadership, the Ombudsman's Office has worked with and helped thousands of families and school officials during her tenure. Whereas Ms. Smith developed an Education Ombudsman Toolkit that is available to Education Ombudsman offices across the country and served as a consultant to emerging Ombudsman offices. Whereas Ms. Smith became a trusted resource for both families and schools, having been requested to mediate conflicts by LEAs, provide technical assistance to schools, and provide advice on family engagement to schools. And whereas Ms. Smith became a sought-out expert, providing her expertise on student discipline to national and local organizations, serving as a speaker at the Atlantic Education Summit in 2017, as a speaker at the United States Ombudsman Association Conference in 2017, as a member of a panel discussion before DC Superior Court judges on the school to prison pipeline crisis, and as a consultant in assisting school founders with family engagement initiatives. Now therefore, be it resolved that the District of Columbia State Board of Education honors former Ombudsman for Public Education, Joanna Smith, on the 24th day of October in the year 2018 for her outstanding service and leadership to the District of Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. Is there a discussion on the resolution? This is where we get to send us into the Seeing no further. Oh, I want to say something. Oh. I can't function tonight. I just wanted to say how much I have truly enjoyed uh, working with Joanna. I am going to miss her so much. And I know the kids that and the families that have dealt with her are going to miss her so much. And I still hear about her. Um, and the work that she did with some of the families out where I am when she came out to do some work on special education. And that is just the least of it, I assure you. Thank you so, so much, and I wish you the best of luck. Just uh, really quickly, 20 seconds. I know we gave you some accolades when you, when you weren't here last month, but I, we, I really do, uh, and I know all of us want to thank you for your outstanding service. I think more than you know, you've really uh, impacted the way that we do education in this city and have really shifted a conversation uh, that is happening right now. We're midstream, but that you really contributed to uh, in such a transformative way. And so I, I want to thank you for your service, not just to the office and and to the state board, but to the children and families of the District of Columbia, because I think your work and the work of your team will impact uh, them more than I think you, you know now, but, but we'll see uh, years from now. So thank you so much. Um, on behalf of students, I just wanted to say thank you for always just fighting for what's right. And Joanna, thank you again. Rocket Ship got very, very lucky with you. Um, you will be missed. You've made such an impact for, with the board, with DC, and I'm, I hope to see you back here, maybe with some public comments and uh, working behind the scenes. Thank you. So Joanna, you are, we've had this discussion, so you know how much I appreciate you. And we're still on for lunch, right? Okay. <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, the motion is huh? the motion is on approval of State Board Ceremonial Resolution 18-9. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion is carried. <laughs> Mr. Theodore C. Hinton, Jr. Over 50 years, for over 50 years, Theodore Ted C. Hinton Jr. has been an inspiration and mentor to students and teachers. He has positively influenced thousands of lives. We are thrilled to have Mr. Hinton, his family, and friends here with us tonight. At this time, I would like to wel welcome a motion on State Board Ceremonial Resolution 18-10 from our Ward 5 representative, Mark Jones. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Excuse me, I'm on 
the wrong page. The motion being properly moved and seconded, I will ask Mr. Haywood to read the resolution. State Board of Education ceremonial resolution to recognize Theodore C. Henton Jr. for his service in the District of Columbia Public Schools, CR 18-10. Whereas Theodore C. Henton Jr., a longtime resident of the Petworth neighborhood in Ward 4 and a native of Apex, North Carolina, has worked in the District of Columbia Public School System for 50 years. Whereas Mr. Hinton has served as a teacher, an administrator, and mentor to thousands of students, parents, and teachers. Whereas Mr. Hinton graduated from Tuskegee University in 1968, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Chemistry, and also received a Master of Arts in Urban Studies from the George Washington University in 1975. Whereas he was a science and math teacher at Taft Junior High School, Watkins Elementary School, Hart Junior High School from 1968 to 1987, an assistant principal at Hine Junior High School from 1987 to 1997, and then a principal at the P.R. Harris Education's Educational Center, Bruce Renroll Elementary School, Tyler Elementary School, Hamilton Junior High School, and McFarland Middle School. Whereas Mr. Hinton served from 2009 to 2018 as Dean of Culture at Powell Bilingual Elementary School, and whereas Mr. Hinton was a strong proponent of positive reinforcement using that philosophy to help all students find direction in their lives by stressing the importance of believing in yourself and set high expectations for himself and the adults around him. Now therefore, be it resolved that on the occasion of his retirement, the State Board of Education recognizes and honors the half century of service Theodore C. Henton Jr. has given to DCPS and honors his lasting legacy of learning, self-improvement, and success on generations of students. Thank you, Mr. Haywood. Is there a discussion on the resolution? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I want to say I want to thank uh, Mr. Hinton for 50 years of serving our families in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Hinton, of course, recently I found out I have friends who uh, shared classrooms with him. Um, I have friends who their parents taught with him. And it's a special day because we're talking about teacher retention and keeping teachers. And he's exhibited exactly what we want to see in this city. Long-term teachers that support our families. For 50 years, Mr. Hinton, I appreciate your service to the city. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is on approval of State Board Ceremonial Resolution 18-10. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion is approved. <laughs> the State Board will now take a short recess to present the ceremonial resolutions to our honorees. Will Dr. Hinton and Ms. Smith come forward.
this one, he was at Duke. Uh, 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 my son was a student. I would hate to see him present. But the thing is, my son's still talking to him now all these years later. And it's, it's talking about the wall. I'm a lion. I'm a lion. <laughs> Now, who am I going to chat with? And as she steps out, we're going to wish a very happy birthday. Happy birthday to Karen Williams, our president. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll dispense with the singing. And we'll come back to order um, and finish with a couple of panels on teacher retention. Students learn best from highly skilled teachers that are continuously improving. If teachers are not supported with opportunities to grow, they will leave our classrooms and the building of trust must start once again. I'm pleased to welcome a number of experts on teacher retention this evening. We'll proceed with regular order. All witnesses will have five minutes to speak. I am going to be quite firm on five minutes to speak, followed by questions of members of the board, questions and statements. Um, we will have two panels of witnesses tonight. When I call your name, please come to the table. The first panel will include Mary Levy, who's an education researcher, and Abigail Cohen, a senior associate policy and advocacy at the Data Quality Campaign, as well as Scott Goldstein, Executive Director of Empower Ed. Oh, we actually are just going to have one panel, which is great, um, <laughs> which I've just learned. Thank you. Uh, we will also include Laura Fuchs, who's a teacher at H.D. Woodson High School, and Samantha Brown, uh, a teacher at Coolidge High School. I really thank you all for being here, particularly our, um, our active teachers. Um, I'm going to have a little statement later, but Y'all are putting yourselves out there by coming here and talking about these issues uh, in a very transparent way. And uh, you're an example for your students and for policymakers here in the district. And we really appreciate you putting yourselves out there. You'll have five minutes to speak. And um, let's start on the left, your left. And you'll have five minutes each. After you've all spoken, board members will do um, questions. Thank you so very much. Can you turn your microphone on, please? It, it's going to be right around that. There you go. OK. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, 
My name is Samantha Brown. I'm a, re I'm a seventh year teacher licensed in special education, ESL, and English. I currently work at Calvin Coolidge Senior High School. Teaching is a field that supports a growth mindset. To move mountains, one has to be prepared and ready for the struggle. In teaching, we are asked to move mountains every day. However, we are asked to move those mountains alone, watching our own ba backs, working in fear. There are no perfect teachers as there are no perfect students. However, there are environments that fosters great teaching. That is, this is the purpose of a growth mindset, an environment that fosters learning, risk-taking, thus growth. An environment where we celebrate our success in terms of how far we've come, not where we started. As such, for a growth mindset to be realized, there must be failure present. Without failure, growth and our realization of our strengths are never actualized. My understanding of a growth mindset was challenged this year. This school year was my first time teaching advanced placement literature. I was excited yet afraid. However, I dived into the curriculum and challenged my students and challenged them to think more. I'm sorry and challenge them to think more, write more, and engage with the work after school. My students' response were fear and anger. Students and parents complained every week. Students became disruptive in the class. After three weeks, I wanted to quit AP literature. I began to feel that maybe I wasn't ready for such high-level teaching. However, my principal would not allow me to quit. As a result, I doubled my planning and met with my instructional coach weekly. We planned together, modeled lessons for each other, looking over plans and data. I remember the day we decided to co-teach a lesson together. I was very nervous. I thought my students would view me as weak and inexperienced. However, I decided to trust the process and reminded myself that growth was the most important goal. After our co-taught lesson, my classroom environment improved tremendously. I learned multiple lessons from my failure the first three weeks of school and during my collaboration with my instructional coach. First, I learned that teaching is a learning and growing process. The best teachers are the ones who are not afraid to fail and always prepared to grow. Further, furthermore, I learned that a growth mindset requires a growth environment. A growth environment in education is one where the learning and growth of the teacher is just as important as the learning and growth of our students. However, learning can't take place without mistakes and failures. Without the failures I experienced during the earlier part of the year, I would not have realized my best self. My failures forced me to study more, reflect more, and reach out more. However, under the current impact system, teachers and principals are not allowed to fail, which is necessary for success. The system feels punitive and shrouded in fear. I fear for my observation score. I fear for my student surveys. I fear for my task results. However, the support and love I receive from my instructional coach and during one of my lowest points in my teaching is what allowed me to first take risks with the knowledge that I would be supported. Even when I felt discouraged, my dis instructional coach mentored me until I regained my footing and my confidence. Never once did someone threaten to throw me away because I had a bad three weeks. There is no room for politics in education. Education, especially education in DC, cannot afford any more politics. We can't afford to, teach, to treat teaching as a revolving door of impersonal objects while we wait for Superman. Superman is all of us who care and who has the passion to make change. In order to find Superman, we have to embrace a growth mindset. In order to embrace a growth mindset, we have to put away devices of fear and punishment. Good teaching nor good leadership cannot survive in a fearful environment. One cannot adequately serve children working in fear. We can hold each other accountable without fear. Impact is a fearful system that is hurting our spirits and our ability to embrace a growth mindset. Thank you very much. Good evening, members of the board and staff. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Abigail Cohen, and I'm a senior associate at the Data Quality Campaign. 
At DQC, we work with state leaders every day to help ensure the effective use of data in education. One of my focus areas is state teacher pipelines, so I'm happy to be here today to share our recommendations for the District of Columbia to strengthen its educator pipeline and ensure a high quality teacher for every child in every single classroom. DQC applauds the DC State Board of Education for taking a critical first step towards making this vision a reality by commissioning the October 2018 report on teacher turnover in the district. By publicly acknowledging this issue, the State Board of Education has laid the foundation for today's important conversation. In particular, DQC supports the State Board of Ed's recommendation to create a single data, a single comprehensive and publicly available source of teacher and principal turnover data. District leaders cannot take meaningful action to strengthen our city's educator pipeline if they do not understand the district's unique needs, and they cannot do that without data. Teacher retention is a high priority issue that many states and cities are grappling with, but it is one part of a larger need for better information about the totality of a teacher's experience from preparation to the classroom. Why and when a teacher leaves the profession is deeply connected to how they were trained and their experiences at their particular school. Thus, we must examine issues of teacher retention within the context of these other experiences, which requires a variety of data, including but not limited to data on teacher retention. With access to a richer set of data on educators' experiences across the district, leaders will be better able to answer the critical questions that they have about DC's educator pipeline, including many of the questions laid out in the State Board's own report. Equipped with these answers, leaders will be able to take action and implement targeted, effective policies that help attract and retain high-quality, diverse educators. As you well know, this work is not easy and requires collaboration and time. To ensure that these efforts result in high quality, actionable data, DQC recommends the following. First, ensure that the data being collected is relevant to those who need it. This means starting with your questions and investing in sustainability. Aligning this data with your policy and practice questions about the entire teacher pipeline will make the data relevant and valuable to everyone with a stake in this work, from school leaders to teacher prep providers to district leaders. States that do this alignment are often viewed more as service providers supporting continuous improvement, not mere compliance bodies. To be sustainable, this data work must also include the creation of a data governance structure that defines the roles and responsibilities needed to ensure clear processes for collecting and reporting this data, as well as ensuring accountability for data quality and security. Not only does this simplify the technical work of data collection and sharing, but it also creates a strong base on which to build the relationships and trust across the city's agencies needed to do this work well. Second, the state level oversight body must make sure that policymakers and leaders have access to the data that they need when they need it and the tools and time to use it. This means sharing the data in as real time as possible and facilitating data informed collaboration and discussion. Collecting the data is not enough. It must be made available to leaders on the ground in a timely manner so they can use it for strategic planning. Also, consider leveraging the unique position of the oversight body to convene relevant stakeholders and facilitate collaborative conversations about putting this data to work for students and teachers. Lastly, relevant data should be publicly reported. This means making sure that the data is easy to find and understand. Include relevant indicators on existing reports, like the new state report card, to ensure that the data does not live siloed within any one agency. Proactively communicate about the value of this information to help people understand why this data is being collected and how it helps the city further its mission to provide every child with a high quality education. The DC State Board of Education has taken an important first step by starting this public conversation. The challenges facing educators in our city and across the country are complex and intertwined. Data can help illuminate a path forward and ensure that district leaders are best positioned to create and implement the policies we need to have a strong educator pipeline and ensure a great teacher for every child in every classroom. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohn. Mr. Goldstein. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Goldstein. I'm the founder and executive director of the Teacher Leadership Organization Empower Ed. Mr. And I Goldstein, thank the can, you, can you shut off your microphones, please? We're getting some feedback. Thank you. I want to thank the State Board of Education for putting this issue on the agenda because we cannot build or sustain success in our schools without stability. That's why my organization has put the issue of teacher turnover front and center. 
And I'm glad to be here today to talk about the new data on this issue, but I want to remind everyone at the beginning that data only matters if it's informed by human experience. And too often it can drive us away from personal student and individual school driven solutions. Teacher turnover has a really deep effect on our students. So listening to teacher and student voices and acting on them can help us be driven by those experiences. We have to ask hard questions then about why the data does or does not reflect what we're hearing from teachers, principals, and students. And there's no better window into this than the recent Washingtonian piece Mr. Diaz has a choice to make. So I'll be reading some clips. Mr. Diaz is 26 years old, and he's the most experienced teacher at Aiden Elementary School in Ward 7, a school with 44% annual turnover. The article through this powerful story hits on all the answers to the questions I anticipate that's at the top of your minds, which is, why is Washington DC's turnover unique? Why is it uniquely high? The article talks about the pressure felt to choose between integrity and more impressive metrics. We have a political system for education in DC that's unlike almost any other in the country. That is unique. The teachers at Aiden Elementary said that the message from central office to Aiden was unequivocal. Raise your numbers or else. The teachers liked their principal, but they knew the pressure was unsustainable on both of them. At the end of the year, one of the featured teachers left saying he wanted to teach, and all the policies we prescribe to our priority schools don't allow him to do that. It's all about numbers. Numbers don't go up when teachers can't teach and they can't reach our students. So we have to reverse that formula that says that our highest priority schools get the least autonomy. And I believe DCPS is starting to understand that and is working towards it with ideas like the DCPS Design Lab. It mentions the turnover is likely higher than our numbers suggest because so many are leaving one school for another. We have a system of choice in DC, larger than any other city, and that makes transience the norm for students and teachers alike, and the two are related. The article discusses how hard it is to establish trust with families when turnover is so high. And with families in these wards having so many charter choices, before the teachers can do the hard work of building that trust, families move, and then the teachers leave, and the students often come back, and the families grow more disillusioned, and the cycle feeds itself. Next, we have a habit of taking our most effective principles and shuffling them throughout the district, patching up emergencies with effective principles without the forethought on what happens to the school they just left. Principals on one-year contracts cannot establish a culture that provides consistency to the teaching staff or families. The data on turnover continues to be troubling, 25% overall in both sectors, but the biggest mistake we could make is to believe that this turnover at high priority schools, high poverty schools, is somehow par for the course. We have to reject the notion that turnover is high at higher ri at risk schools because this churn is just a result of burnout from teaching high poverty students. There's no doubt urban education has its challenges, but people are working in DC precisely because they want to teach and work with these students. Back to the article, it says he was 25, fresh out of Teach for America's 2014 Summer Institute, and wanted to work at Aiden so badly, he'd blown off opportunities to work at other schools. He was dying to work at Aiden. That's the school he wanted to teach at. Think about that. Our turnover problem isn't a result of the challenging work that we have with our students. It's a result of adults making that work more difficult for other adults. Our turnover rate has far more to do with the difference in adult culture here in DC than it does in, and than it is in other places. I've seen it myself. You attempt to reach your students and you're told that those efforts are not aligned or not rigorous enough. That's the language people use who don't have experience teaching in our schools. It's not hard to see when you look through the ranks of education policy officials in this city the enormous amount who have two or three years of teaching experience, max. For many, classroom experience was simply a prerequisite to the jobs they truly sought in policy, and there's no knock on that, uh, people who want to go into education policy. But in that world, we have a responsibility to look out for the broader community and for all of our students, because these students and their educations is not a laboratory for our careers. It's their lives and their futures that are on the line. For those reasons, we have to be very careful about how and who these programs choose to recruit. The truth is we're recruiting a lot of teachers who we know aren't likely to stay for more than two or three years. So there's a big difference between teachers who enter our system through a Teach for America style program, though it has its benefits, for example, as opposed to those who enter through something like the Inspired Teaching Residency. And I'll wrap up quickly and I have a longer testimony to submit. But second, we can accept the narrative that our higher than average turnover is a positive indicator of our differential turnover of effective and highly effective teachers. The data does not bore that, bear that out and I'm glad to talk about that more at length. New experience, inexperienced teachers may be cheaper for the system, but that model is not uh, to the benefit of our students. 
Um, there are many solutions to this, and I'm happy in my extended testimony I talk about um, six or seven different uh, suggested solutions, and I'm happy to talk about that more. And thank you, Mr. Goldstein, and, and some of those I'm sure will come up in Q&A. Um, Ms. Levy. <coughs> Uh, good evening, I'm Mary Levy, and uh, I am the author of the report uh, on annual average teacher turnover uh, in District of Columbia schools. Uh, I want to start by just reminding everyone that there are so many ways to slice and dice uh, information and data on teacher turnover that we have to be careful to understand exactly what we're talking about. Whether we're talking about the number and percentage of teachers leaving the school system versus those leaving individual schools. Because there's a difference and it's the latter that counts for the students. And then the question of are we talking about an annual turnover rate or the length of time that individual teachers stay in the system or in a school. Uh, so tonight, uh, I am unveiling a follow-up to the study that I did. Uh, you didn't commission it, so <laughs> if you don't like it, you won't be blamed for it. <laughs> but um, what I did was to compare rosters at each individual school across three years and across five years. Uh, the question had arisen of whether the 25% in my original report, 25% annual uh, average uh, turnover at the school level was sort of a, a smaller group of revolving <laughs> replacements offset by a core, a larger stable core of teachers in, in the schools? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, all of the patterns that I found tracing individual teachers over three years and five years are just the same as they are uh, at the annual rate. Um, First of all, uh, on the average, 55% um, of teachers leave their schools uh, at, within three years. 70% within five years. Uh, there's an enormous range. Um, the lowest three-year rate is 25%. <laughs> at Beers Elementary in Ward 7, and the lowest five-year rate is at 34% at Stoddard in Ward 3, uh, which is uh, more typical of the ward performance, I'm afraid. One quarter of our schools lose between 67% and 100% of their teachers within three years, and 83% to 100% of their teachers within five years. I mean, that's just an enormous turnover rate. Uh, the patterns, as I said, are very much like the annual rate. Among the wards, Ward 3 is low. It's 10 percentage points lower than anybody else. Um, the other low turnover, relatively speaking, uh, groups are the selective high schools and the three lottery schools that everybody loves to get into. The highs among wards, wards five and eight. And then alternative and special education schools. Their rates are very, very high. Uh, the middle schools, on average, lose 80% of their teachers within five years. That's most of our middle schools. We don't have that many. Most neighborhood high schools lose 80% of their teachers within five years. Elementaries are better, they're 67%. Uh, the teacher turnover rate rises with the percentage of at-risk students. It's not all that good even for those with 
fewer than 20% of their students at risk. That's 57% in five years. In other words, over half the teachers in, you know, what are the sort of most desirable, easier schools? 78% uh, uh, leave the schools between 60 and 80% at risk. And those who have more than 80% of their kids at risk, um, they lose 82% of their teachers within five years. Thank you, Ms. Levy. I hope you'll expand on your testimony and your research uh, as we get into the Q&A and as we continue this dialogue with other policy bodies in the city. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fuchs. That was really rough to hear, like really rough. All right, so my name is Laura Fuchs. I'm a Ward 5 resident, DC Public School Social Studies teacher for the past 11 years in my 12th, an executive board member of the Washington Teachers Union, chair of the WTU's Committee on Political Education, a board member of the Ward 7 Education Council, and an active member of the Senior High Alliance of Parents, Principals, and Educators. I say all this to say that I have met and spoken to many educators over the duration of my career, and I've seen countless educators come and go in this city. Um, but I'm gonna speak today really just about myself and my own experience. Um, okay, so when I tell students that I've worked at H.D. Woodson for the past 11 years, they straight up do not believe me. Wait, you were in the tower? Yes. Do you know so-and-so? Yeah, I taught him. And even knowing that I've been here all this time, they ask things like, why don't you go be a lawyer or run for office? Or why do you still teach here with all these bad kids? Anytime I lose my temper or have a bad day, I get asked, you're coming back, right? Um, these interactions are how I know that my students' normal is losing their teachers after a year or two. They do not come to expect stability and are shocked when they find it. They think I'm the longest serving teacher at Woodson. Thank goodness they are incorrect. We do have a lot of veterans at our school. We are one of the few high schools that's held on to them. Um, we pride ourselves on that, and we do still have a huge revolving door, but there are still teachers who retire legitimately after a <laughs> long service. Um, so, luckily, um, sorry. So, in my APUS government class, lately we've been talking about the incumbency advantage. While this applies to political candidates running for office, it also applies to teaching. When discussing how it works, we talk about building a name for yourself and how people often do not trust something new, and why should they? They all joked when I said that I'd built a name for myself at H.D. Woodson. They said, yeah, you're hard. You don't mess with Ms. Fuchs. Um, but they couldn't deny the logic. They'd all come in knowing something about me. Everyone knew how to pronounce my name, and to them, it was obvious. That's what they said. They laughed. I was like, well, some people don't know how to pronounce it. And they're like, what are you talking about? Um, but I told them, I remembered 10 years ago when most students did not know and were very timid because they did not want to say the not-so-nice word that it resembles. But that's the thing. I've been there for the, their entire H.D. Woodson career. I've been there. Students who like history now look forward to getting to their senior year and the opportunity to take my AP class. The fact is the same logic that applies to political incumbents applies to educators in our classrooms. We have to prove to our students whose world is often turning around them in every way imaginable that we are here for them. And the only way to prove it is to stay. I know the importance of teacher stability for schools. I live it every day. But despite my deep commitment to the community-based teaching and providing stability for my students by simply showing up year after year, I sometimes find myself considering if I can keep it up. Impact and high-stakes evaluation tools combined with one-year principal contracts is incredibly damaging to our schools. I'm always on edge. I'm never sure if I will get to stay. Students are shocked when they find that out. We try to keep it from them as educators, but my older students can handle it, so I let them know if an evaluation year is going poorly for me. I feel they have a right to know why teachers really leave so they don't internalize it on themselves. 
Almost every teacher I have known that left or retired earlier than they had planned has left because of impact in some fashion or another. I've known very few to actually be impacted out, mostly before that can happen. The messaging around impact is toxic. Everything about it feels like a gotcha. Even in the years I do well, I still hate it and get anxiety when someone walks in the room. I always feel judged, never supported. That isn't any individual's fault. It's the system that's broken. It has to be done away with if DCPS is going to have a chance of retaining more teachers. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, and thank you to all the panelists for being here this evening and, and sharing your testimony. It's incredibly important. Um, it's heartfelt, and you are helping inform this body and other folks throughout the district. With that, I will turn it over to my colleagues for questions. Uh, we will do one round of five-minute questions that will allow board members to have a bit of a dialogue. But whether it's a statement or a question, witnesses will be cut off from answering after five minutes. So we will keep to five minutes. Um, who would like to go first? Mr. Jones, our, the dean of our, uh, of our body. Thank you, Mr. President, or Vice President. Um, I've got a statement and some observations and some questions. Um, oftentimes in this city, uh, and, and Mary, I met you over 20 years ago and worked with you on the uh, hybrid campaign for Anthony Williams when I managed that for him. I don't know if you recall. Oh, okay. Um, but the reason why I say that and, and mention the hybrid uh, campaign, because too often in this city, uh, we're doing one-offs in education and everything. And we're not looking at it in a holistic approach. So for me, it's a much larger question. Uh, and how do we con connect the dots, basically? Uh, so some of the questions I have is, are a few of the questions. One is, we're losing teachers, uh, and we're talking about impact, and I have some comments about impact. Uh, but how much are we l losing teachers due to housing and, and cost of living uh, issues in the city? Or is that an issue? I don't know, and uh, as I said in my original report, I think it's very important that just these bare bones numbers that I put together be followed up by some carefully designed research to find out uh, why it is that teachers leave. And I don't know whether the housing prices are a problem, they're a problem for most people. On the other hand, we do have uh, the highest teacher salaries around all the way through the first 10 years on the salary schedule. And um, years ago, we uh, got rid of the residency requirement. Uh, so I would say that's one thing which should be put into a study. Okay. But I don't I don't really know. I have lots of speculation, and so does everybody else, about why teachers leave. Okay. I mean, any other the uh, other uh, panelists, if you want to speak to any of the questions, it's just really quickly. We had teach so Woodson. We get a lot of teachers from PG County since we're right on the line. But I had a teacher who had been commuting from Delaware, and she would have stayed. She loved the school so much, and she loved the kids so much, and she was a 15-year educator, mostly in PG County before that. She would have continued that commute if it weren't for impact. So I mean, yes, I'm sure that housing is an issue for some teachers, and they make choices. And some teachers I know have moved for commute sake within DCPS, like they try to move somewhere closer, but so much of it is tied to evaluation. Okay. And I just wanted to mention, I mean, we have so many teachers, a large percentage of them who come in from Maryland and Virginia, they're living out there and they're coming in for a higher salary to teach in D.C. So I don't think the housing prices, although really important as a policy issue, are the, are the big tie-in here. I think what's different about our schools, they might come in for that higher salary. Um, what's different is the culture, 
right, that we've created, uh, and, and like I talked about the political system, which is what's unique about DC compared to some of the other cities with comparable turnover uh, or schools. Okay, um, now let's chat about impact briefly. Um, I, I'm, I'm a fan of, of processes like impact, and, and, and I came out of that culture uh, before I went to go, before I came home to work in government, I worked on Wall Street, and we had a similar system to to measure our success. Um, but I'm not suggesting that impact is is the correct tool. Uh, I'm suggesting that we need a tool, but we need a tool that that is holistic in in, in our approach. I only have a few seconds, so I'm. I'd like to hear what sort of elements should be in that, that tool that, that's important um, so people won't have to well, answer the question. I only got 20 seconds, I'm sorry. Someone. <laughs> so um, I think there are many places that have effective tools that we can look and find, find out what tools will work best. I think DC is unique because DC has a very unique system that's not working. So that's the first thing. It's mirrored off a of very, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and you can, you can expand on that if, uh, 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 during someone else's time, perhaps mine yeah, even. Um, other board members with questions? Ms. Wattenberg? And then we'll go with Ms. McClay and down the line. I'll go because I'm following up on impact anyway, so people can answer my questions and maybe continue with, with Mark's. Impact has come in for a, a lot of uh, criticism tonight um, in a lot of different ways. So I want to just throw out a few things that I've heard and let people talk about what they think the biggest issues are in terms of it. So one is that the checklist approach itself requires teachers to do certain things that aren't necessarily the right things uh, to be done. And somebody gave an example of that earlier. Um, one that I have heard uh, that didn't come up tonight, and it's, but it's that uh, teachers feel like they're going to get very poor impact scores, and so they leave before they get pushed out. I want to say I've also heard from teachers that this is a reason why, so going back, one of the ideas behind, behind impact, as I understand it, was that um, teachers who were very effective would then get the, the super extra premium pay in order if they went to the highest poverty schools or lowest achieving schools. And my understanding is that a lot of teachers um, don't want to take that money and go there because they feel that the evaluation system itself is disproportionately unfavorable to teachers in high poverty schools and so they'll go to those schools and they will leave lose their good rating they'll lose their extra money and they could in fact uh, be pushed out of the job altogether um, and then we've also heard just that the test scores themselves that that, that being a portion of the impact uh, evaluation that, that itself causes great pressure so I want to give one counterbalance to that, and then I want to hear from other people about uh, what is the biggest problem with it. Um, if you don't have test scores in, a t in an evaluation system, arguably you give even greater discretion uh, to the principals um, who can then use the system to go after the evaluation system to subjectively lower the score of, of anybody that is a problem in the school. And I know some people have thought that the test scores could alleviate that a little bit, that it created a more um, uh, objective uh, measure that could counteract what might be the subjective views of principals who might not like a particular teacher. So with that said, um, comment. So the question is, what, what, are the biggest, what are the biggest problems with it? Because it comes up a lot. What are the biggest issues with the? So this is the thing, um, and thank you so much for both your questions. This is the thing. I, I know everybody has a different opinion on what to do, but the, the fact is that it is a fearful system. It is a fear. There is fear in the system. People are afraid. The students feel, see that fear, and it's not sustainable because we're, we've, we've done this for 10 years. I'm thinking 10 years. Our scores are the lowest in the city and in the country, one of the lowest in the country, and um, it's unique compared to other school systems within the country. 
And um, I want to end by saying that the reason why I brought the growth mindset is because that is something that is, that is encouraged, that is pushed out there. You cannot have a growth mindset system and have a fearful system where people are constantly fearful of their jobs. My situation these first three weeks of school was that I did fail in certain aspects, but I was able to, to get back up and um, to be able to, to learn from my failures. My students were able to see that, but I also had support, and I, and I, and I was able to um, be able to have someone to talk to and mentor me and feel comfortable. We need that type of environment for our students to excel and for our teachers to excel. So it's not about right, the tool necessarily or the rubric itself, but the culture right, that it creates and the environment that it creates between a principal and their staff. I think that's the biggest factor. And I think if you ask anybody with individual school experience, they'll show you that you know, when we talk about differential turnover, which I didn't finish expanding on earlier, we have teachers who are effective, rated effective or highly effective for a dozen years, and then a new principal comes in and suddenly they're rated developing. If that teacher leaves, they are counted as losing a developing teacher, even though they were effective almost their entire lives or careers. And what I didn't talk about before, but Mary's research really points out, is that 2,000 teachers in the last five years were rated effective and highly effective and left. 53% of the teachers we've lost were effective and highly effective. And DCPS cites that retaining 93% of our highly effective and effective teachers. There are more teachers who get that rating than other teachers, uh, than inexperienced or ineffective teachers. And that's a good thing. Um, but the, even by her numbers, the number's in the 80s and not in the 90s. So differential turnover is something we have to discuss as well. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. McClay. So my questions tonight are going to be directed mainly towards Mary and Scott. Uh, with Mary, with your with your uh, report, your, you talk about uh, some of the standout schools, such as Beard and Stoddard, or Beers and Stoddard, and as well as obviously the selective. And you said lottery schools. Or do you mean application schools? Yeah, but they are assigned, students are assigned to them by lottery. They don't pick their students. It's uh, Capitol Hill, Montessori, oh, okay. and okay. Ron Brown, and um, the uh, school within a school. Okay, a couple of It's of those three. Up here we're trying to figure out which schools exactly the three you were talking about. Yeah. In the full version of the report, they're named. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what exactly do you think those schools are doing well to have the highest uh, or the least teacher turnover rate in, in the district? And what can we do to keep our teachers? We, we talk all about some of the solutions. Scott, you said you had some of the solutions or potential solutions, you think, um, especially in these low in income areas where we see higher turnover rates than average. Um, would that be something along those raises or changing the makeup, uh, the culture, et cetera? Sure, so I'm glad to go into those. So first of all, we have to, I think, reflect on the fact that, like I said, the turnover is not a result of the fact that this, at, at risk students are, are higher, but it's not because of the at risk students, right? It's because of the policies we prescribe only for schools with high at risk students, right? And so I think that's the differentiation to make because it's really important that the students in these real examples don't internalize that this turnover is about themselves. So into the solutions, first of all, giving teachers release time to work on school challenges, um, not just instructional ones, but when they identify a problem in their school and they can work with their administrator and get release time uh, from class to be able to solve that problem, take a leadership role in it, more distributive leadership. Teacher prep programs, I think, need to prepare our, our incoming teachers for how to be involved in school decision making and adult culture, not only for how to teach, Right? There's a lot of politics and culture in a school that you have to know how to navigate to be successful as a teacher. And teacher prep programs don't focus on how do you deal with the culture of a school. And I think that would make a big difference. Involving teachers in planning and execution of professional development. Teacher-led PD uh, has become a trend. We're not doing it here in DC. Um, when you look at uh, the LEAP model that we've integrated, right? it's a lot of a central office giving 
teachers a curriculum for them to be the middleman for implementing, right? Um, true teacher leadership, right? Teachers come up with the ideas. Um, we elevate people with really uh, innovative ideas and allow them to implement um, those ideas. Teacher-led PD has paid great dividends in other places. We have to then make the jobs of teachers and principals more sustainable um, and the work-life balance. So we're actually just starting today and moving forward, we're, we're starting to par partner with another organization that does self-care um, to do self-care and teacher voice uh, workshops together with schools because they need the, the momentary self-care, what makes them feel better in the moment, right? Um, and it relieves that stress, but then they also need the daily appreciation and self-care, which is being involved in decision-making, feeling valued in their work, integrating their work and life, not just balancing them, but integrating them in a healthy way because we can't really leave our jobs when we leave the school. Um, and so uh, all those things are priorities. What those schools are doing well is they have great principles. I mean, all the numbers that you look at, right, will, will tell you that when there's a great principal in the school, these other factors go away. If you trust your principal and the principals trust you, these things uh, work out and they have much lower turnover rates. So we saw from the principal earlier. I agree, principals set the culture of the school. Um, adding in the teachers, if anybody else wants to talk about some of the solutions they see. I mean, I'm gonna second the principal piece. I mean had six now um, and <laughs> honestly I mean, what has kind of been good about all of them is they've all decided to sacrifice themselves rather than sacrifice the people in their mm -hmm. building so even though we've had kind of this high rate of turnover it hasn't always been like the worst thing though maybe we didn't always want to lose them um, but the holistic approach so like just to get back to impact briefly the holistic approach you can use that rubric holistically if you want to my principles usually have when they come in like a sledgehammer, they could, you could give me a 1.0 and you could give me a 4.0 and not tell a lie. Yeah. Like, so I mean, it just doesn't work. Thank you. If you Any can be comments? quite brief. Oh, so I, I agree um, with Laura as well. I also want to mention that one of the things that we lack in some of the, the struggling schools is the idea of the instructional coach, of that mentor, even for veteran teachers. Those type of people bring in more support when it comes to instructional coach and mentors, where you're really working with that teacher one on one and supporting that teacher, not in a punitive way, that can really, really help struggling teachers. Um, Thanks, Ms. Brown. Uh, Mr. Thank Bachelor. Thank you. So I want to thank you all for uh, spending, uh, spending a little bit of time with us this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, but you have given us tremendous insight into what I think began with a conversation with Ms. Levy at our working session earlier this month. And I think throughout the evening, we've been able to really put some, some flesh on the bones about uh, and really get some ideas of why some, some educators uh, are, are leaving um, our system. And uh, more importantly, I think, especially with this panel, some ways we can improve the way we support educators uh, and really keep them uh, in our system. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, my first question was, I think, where do we begin? I think we're in this transitional period um, in our system where we're gonna get a new chancellor, we have a new deputy mayor for education, and I think this would be the perfect time for us to really change practice that we know will improve outcomes uh, in, in so many different ways. And But I think I heard some of that um, in, in response to the previous question, but if you have anything else, I, I love to hear it, but I'll ask my second question, and it was really specifically inspired by Ms. Brown's uh, uh, conversation around a growth mindset, right? We understand that being an educator is not being some, you know, frontline employee that's just kind of trans transactional. Being an educator is a very complicated profession that constantly evolves, and we need to give our educators the room uh, to really improve, uh, not just for themselves, but for their students. Uh, the room and the time is what I should say, and, and I think we talked about how impact really cuts that time uh, unnecessarily into the detriment of teachers and students. Um, 
in terms of the growth mindset, I also wonder if any of you has an anecdotally or some insight into how teachers felt about their opportunity for advancement, either in their school or in the system, uh, and whether or not uh, that has impacted any educators' uh, decision to leave the system because they just didn't feel like they were able to grow enough in their profession. I mean, at, I'll speak for Woodson and just the teachers I know best. People want to stay. Like, we get frustrated by, like, the idea that to advance our careers, we have to leave the school. Like, we talk about it a lot at our school because we get so many people who have used their limited time in education to come into our school and tell us what to do. It's on our minds a lot because we're sitting here being like, well, my plan is to stay here. Like, that's the plan. And we have a two or three year, you know, teacher, now our assistant principal, who suddenly has all the power over whether or not I get to continue with my plan, which would be to hopefully stay at Woodson. Um, and I know that they don't have a plan to actually stay at Woodson, but they could remove me from my life plan based on their limited experience. And I can only imagine the 20 year veterans having to face down that dragon at the same time. Um, I want to say like, just real brief, in terms of this one potential solution, Almost no other jurisdiction that I know in this area does a high stakes evaluation every single year on professionals who have earned at least like a couple years in the classroom. And that might provide that room for growth because we don't, I mean, if there's like, there's all sorts of elements where it can get triggered if you're doing something real crazy on your off year for your evaluation. But like, we don't need to always be under the gun, especially for veterans who've proven themselves for years at a time. I just want to um, go back to the, the report that we're all sort of here for, and one of the major findings, which was that we, we don't have enough data to understand the nuance of a lot of these issues. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be talking about solutions, but I would just really encourage that before we immediately jump into here's the action steps we need to take, that we assess the information that we do have and we under, understand the holes and the lack of information and figure out how to get that so that when we do capitalize on this moment and take action, it's the right action and it actually improves the experience for our teachers. So I agree with that. I do think there's a lot of data that we haven't taken into account into this, right? So there have been a lot of studies of this that aren't uh, right now uh, and the ones that we're talking about. Um, and I would just say, I'll just speak personally, right? I taught for 10 years here um, and, and left to take on this work. And I wanted to take on leadership roles and I came, I switched from DC charter schools to the public sector because DCPS had promoted a lot of teacher leadership opportunities. Uh, when I found myself in those roles, I felt like I didn't really have the autonomy to implement my ideas, but was implementing somebody else's. And I think with genuine teacher leadership roles, we can allow people like me who desperately wanted to stay in the classroom and take on leadership uh, roles to do both of those things at the same time. And all the exit surveys have indicated that as one of the top uh, three or four uh, reasons for leaving. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bachelor. Ms. Robinson, do you have questions? No. Um, I will take the last five minutes, and I'm gonna start by doing um, two housekeeping pieces that I should have done at the beginning of the panel, and I apologize. Um, Ms. Brown serves on this board's ESSA task force, and we appreciate your service there. Um, and Ms. Fuchs does as well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and Ms. Levy is a paid consultant. She, she wrote this uh, report on behalf of the board and was paid by the board, and I just wanna make sure that that's very clear and on the record, and we appreciate your involvement in this conversation and discussion, I just wanna make sure that we're being transparent and clear on that. Um, and I also wanna thank I'm, the, the public witnesses that were earlier and the teachers that are here tonight. Um, you're putting your careers and yourselves on the line by testifying before us. That really matters. It matters a lot to us. Um, and we know it's a risk for you. I know that every time I see Laura, She's here to talk about an issue that she believes in and she wants to do right by the students she serves. And that's what we want to. And we thank you for having this dialogue with us. And we thank you for serving the students of the district. Um, I also wanna hit on something that Ms. Levy said uh, at our working session, I think three weeks ago or so, which is this report that has been published is literally just numbers. And I'm gonna to get to you, um, Ms. Cohen, to expand on this concept, which you have already begun. 
this is just not strict numbers on teacher turnover. It does not go in, it, it's quant qualitative, it's, it's quantitative, not qualitative. And this is the first step in a long conversation that's long overdue across the city. We have mayoral control. This conversation could have been begun by the executive branch. It hasn't been. It could have been done by the legislative branch. It hasn't been. It's been started now by us, your State Board of Education members. And we're going to continue this conversation. So I thank you all for that. And as I've been listening all night to all of the, all of the witnesses that we've had, I've made a sort of a running list, and I know I missed some of the points that were made on why teachers leave. I'm going to just list them, what I've heard so far. Principal leadership, impact, trauma, training, fear, lack of mentorship, lack of professional development, poor or damaging LEA planning, burnout, culling the herd by getting rid of low impact score teachers, hiring practices, school culture and school politics, one year principal contracts. And that doesn't even hit on other regular life things such as moving, true retirement, or as the case could be in my family, military redeployment. So there, are a, there is a lot to unpack here. And Ms. Cohen, could you go into that? What are the next steps now? We've seen there's a problem. We see that we are statistically different than other similar sized cities and other than other similarly situated jurisdictions. We're significantly higher. What do we need to do next? How does this conversation continue? One of the things that I noted in the report was that it, it launched a lot of other questions, right? There's a lot we don't know. We sort of have this baseline evidence that we know there's an issue with teacher tur turnover, but we don't necessarily know who's leaving, why, et cetera. So it sounds basic, but I would really encourage leaders to think what are the key questions that we need to answer, not just about retention, but about teachers as a whole when it comes to who's coming into our system, who's leaving our system, um, and what are the different characteristics of the teachers that we're losing most frequently so that you, we can start to zero in on are there particular patterns that we can identify? Are they coming from particular teacher prep programs? Um, are, te are we losing teachers of color more frequently? You know, why? What is, what is their experience like and why is it different from their colleagues? So I really think it's important to think about what are the um, key questions that we want to answer about this issue and then map back what information do we have based on the existing research and where we have holes we need to fill those holes and it's not just to, to the discussion we've had tonight it's not just about quali or quantitative data right we need to have conversations with teachers and principals through opportunities like this focus groups surveys things like that it should it needs to be sort of a mix of, of different types of information so that we can have that um, that fuller picture, and I'm happy to share offline um, different examples from other states who, who have done that. That's terrific, and in my last 30 seconds, I'm not gonna ask another question, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna give any, anyone else an, a, a, an opportunity to respond because I wanna be, have fidelity to the five minutes. We really want to make sure that we do the next steps right and that we continue this conversation um, because it's important to our students. Right? We want to make sure that we have the supports around the students and the teachers um, so that our students can be successful after, after they're done matriculating with us. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for your service. And, and um, thank you all for being here. Thanks from, from all of us. <clears throat> Uh, on behalf of the State Board, I want to express our deep appreciation to our panel of witnesses for your testimony. The discussion has been incredibly helpful. And before we close for the evening, do members of the board have any upcoming events that they'd like to highlight or anything of that nature? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Batchelor. Uh, Mark and I will be competing uh, in the eighth annual Dancing with the Scholars. Mm -hmm. Uh, tournament on what is that Saturday November 10th at the Arc um, and I look forward to bringing home the championship again for the Great War Day. <laughs> <laughs> Fixed. <laughs> I'm gonna try and get there it is amazing absolutely amazing. Ms. Robinson. I just wanted to announce that my birthday is in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well happy early birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Um, with that, board members, um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Any objections? We adjourn.